according to Davos, Stannis, very much like Shaft, is a complicated man. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave. This is going to be another edition of Dragoncast for Season 5 of HBO's Game of Thrones. Today we will be discussing Episode 3, High Sparrow. Of course this will be a spoiler full discussion of all published books in George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, as well as all aired episodes of HBO's Game of Thrones. Uh, we will not be spoiling any leaked episodes or any Winds of Winter spoiler chapters, so you're safe on that score. Uh, my name is Greg, I'm Claudius the Fool on the forums, and I'm joined by eight other vassals tonight. You guys want to introduce yourself? Uh, hey, this is Zach. I go by Alias on the forums. This is Matt, Varley on the forums. This is Nicole and Gazrain on the forums. This is Bing, uh, Shushina on the forums. Hi, this is Stephen, SJ Lee on the forums. This is Paul, known as Pod's Plight. And hi, I'm Patrick. Patrick the Toll on the forums. He's back. He is. Patrick <laughs> is infiltrating us from uh, from Dragon Cat, uh, Wolfcast. This is Dragoncast, yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll allow it. We'll see how it goes this episode. But he obviously has not <laughs> enough to talk about. Did we get Adam in there? Did he? Oh, I think I missed my cue. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you have to yeah. leave then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, they're editing me out of the show notes. Um, you botched it. <laughs> if your name's not there, then you're not here. That's how. It, that's how the works. And this is Adam, Drowned Snow on the forums. Okay, so we're going to stick to the same format as uh, last week. We'll just be going by region, um, but of course we will, we will be giving our lemon cakes to start off. I'll save myself for last because I'm a gracious host. So, Zach, would you like to start off with the lemon cake ratings? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, this was a good episode. Um, I, I don't think I enjoyed it as much as everyone else did. It seemed like there was a lot of positive response to this one where it felt like the you know all the kind of storylines were really getting going, whereas it was a lot of build up in the last two. I, I thought that this episode in isolation, it took a bit for me to get really into it. I thought some of the first early scenes, I just wasn't really feeling much. Um, but besides that, there's obviously a lot of cool stuff that happened, a lot of stuff that it's interesting that we're going to have to talk about a lot uh, that happened in there, too. So, yeah, um, I'd probably give it, you know four lemon cakes out of five yeah i give it uh 4.5 i think on the forums uh i really like this episode i think the acting was some of the best we've seen just like the little like back and forth with marjorie and cersei that we'll get into later uh what's her name macy williams (laughs) when she's like contemplating uh (laughs) you know needle i I, it it was just like a lot of good acting i like the episode and I like where they're going with it because I don't really know where they're going with it. So we'll see. I really like the episode. I gave it like a 4.5, I think. I, I just, again, really enjoyed watching it like last week. And yeah, thought it was awesome. At least we're now on board with the Santa stuff. So yay. Adam, how about you? Um, I'll give it another four, another solid four. I liked I liked most of the scenes. I thought all the performances were good. I mean, Cersei, Marjorie, Arya, just pretty much everything yeah i don't know I, th- I thought it was a pretty we'll get into it later but i thought it was i thought it was a pretty solid episode except for maybe one scene uh is it me now okay uh i think i'm giving it a four lemon cakes just like uh adam i mean i like there's a lot of good little subtle moments of acting and uh, some really killer dialogues that i loved i'm not sure if there's anything that's really big that jumped out at me to give me to make me give a higher rating but um mm. yeah it's pretty good pretty good episode i think uh I guess I run contrary to the rest of the group. I I thought it was a fine episode, but nothing to write home about. I'd probably give it three out of five lemon cakes. Uh, For positives, I really enjoyed the introduction of the High Sparrow. I am really excited to see what develops from his character the rest of the season. I thought everything involving Tom in this episode was fantastic and hilarious. Uh, (laughs) So I enjoyed every aspect of that plot. It had a lot of great moments, but for some reason it just didn't add up to a very interesting episode for me. Yeah, I think I felt the same way, though. I was maybe kinder with it than than you but yeah I, I, it just felt like kind of disconnected to me there was a lot of individual good stuff but yeah it really wasn't coming together i'll give it a 4.321 because things are about to blast Whoa. off and get really interesting now in this season i want to ask you how, how, how much time do you That's put great. into your weird numbers because i pictured you with at least like a spending a solid half hour trying to get yeah it. i have my calculator <laughs> okay. out and i'm just tabulating <laughs> things a little bit but yeah it really th- it seems like things are going to get it pretty wild now with uh, Sansa getting involved with the Boltons and with things in King's Landing really heating up between Cersei and Marjorie, Good stuff all around. Looking forward to continuing. Patrick, your turn. Yeah. Okay, well, I uh, I would give it a 3.9999 just because I don't want to give it a full four because I didn't feel like it was it, – it wasn't deserving of, of, of like the high, high marks specifically. Well, I, well, what would you have needed to get that last .0001? 
Uh, surpass. A boob. <laughs> surpass. It's, well, yeah, it's small, just a small thing. It's just something to connect it all. But uh, yeah, it, it felt like, well, you can't say anything about Game of Thrones. It's, it's essentially one of the best shows out there. So in in, in essence, it, it for me, it almost automatically gets a three unless it really fucks something up. So, but... but other than that, it was just, yeah, there wasn't really any, there wasn't like a, a, a main thread through the whole story, to this this one, instead of the last episode. So yeah, essentially, I just felt it's, it wasn't as good, but yeah. You're allowed, that's right. I gave it, I almost wanted to give it a five. I was trying to think of like a major issue I had with it, and I didn't have a major issue. There were a couple little ones, but I, I, I felt like I couldn't give an episode like this a five, because where do you go from here? But I, I gave it a 4.5. I really enjoyed it. Um, the, everything on the wall with Janus and, and Stannis is not. I will not. I mean, I will admit that I've watched that many, many times already. Um, but it was... <laughs> looping gifts. Looping, yes. <laughs> Stannis approves of many things. Um, but it was just, it was... The stuff with Sansa, I was super relieved that they they basically turned her into fake Arya. So, like, I feel like we're not going to be spoiled as much as we might have been. They, there still may be spoilers, but she's not Elaine anymore. She's Sansa. It's a completely different storyline. And that might spoil stuff going little things, but I don't think it's really going to be spoiling her story going forward for wins, which a lot of people were worried about. Um, so I, I was super relieved about that. And Kyburn, I'll give it a full lemon cake for, for Kyburn's three lines in this episode because they were all hilarious and awesome. Uh, so we can get right down into it. Let's head start off with Arya in the House of Black and White in Bravos. This is the first time we've really seen the inside of the House in Black and White. And I just wanted to get like your overall impressions because it seemed to be most people were impressed with it. I kind of just thought it was a little underwhelming and simp- like a simplified version, like with four giant gods on the walls. Like in the books, I pictured this like vast open area with just it, everything there. And the fact that it, it just seemed like a, a boiled down version of, of the books, which they've done with other stuff. But what did you guys think of the of just the inside of the House of Black and White? Well, I guess you're right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you are right, because in the books, it's like in the middle of like every kind of like cathedral of every religion ever. And inside, we only get, like, what, four four gods or something? So, yeah, it's a little underwhelming, yeah. but in the show, it works. Yeah, but we do, we do get confirmation. We were speculating last week. We get confirmation of, like, that the people do go in there to do the water drinking thing. They're, they're keeping that aspect mm. of, the, of the temple. Wasted no time on that. Nothing oh. can compete with the power of Greg's imagination, but it was okay for what it can, what it can do on TV. <laughs> it wasn't a major complaint. That was just, it was just like, oh, that's nice, but it could have been more, but I'm, I'm fine. The lighting is so bad where I watched the show that I just couldn't see anything in there. <laughs> so it was just it like Arya really in the dark. darkness the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Guess you can never die of thirst in there. <laughs> yeah. Can we hiss again? <laughs> of course we can hiss. Okay. I thought the um the design of the House of Black and White was intentional to play off of the portrayal of the the seven and their religion in this episode. So you get the pomp and circumstance and grandness of the the seven and you know obvious corruption there that contrast with the house of black and white which is a very plain um no frills religion or or institution and then you also get the high sparrow you know kind of three points on this yeah. trinity of portraying religions and i don't think of that yeah no that's why that's why i really actually really liked it that way i mean it is it is yeah underwhelming but i, I like it being underwhelming so it, it feel it fits the theme of generally like the, we this you are no one this place is nowhere, nothing. It was a little bit like, do you remember the last episode of Lost? Like the very, very end of Lost? <laughs> no, because I haven't watched it. Watching it. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay. Do you want to take out my earbuds? Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I won't, I guess, contextualize it, but there's this scene in like a vague um, generic cathedral and like they literally have a stained glass window in the back with like all the religious symbols. <laughs> so they have like a cross and a moon and a star of David and the you know, I'm wow, my ignorance is showing, but everything else. I and think you got all of them. <laughs> you got the big That's all. Yeah. No werewolves. There were no All the major monotheistic of the religions. <laughs> that is all the religions. Um, but yeah, and and I haven't ever rewatched that episode, but um, in retrospect, that was really hammering it home. Um, yes, but I liked I liked the way it looked, and I was I was pleased to see that not only like they don't just like go and drink, but like it seems like they like the like Jaken has a role in that and you know there's caretaking yeah exactly 
instead of Arya just like accidentally giving a guy poison water and like, <laughs> oh my god, what happened? Yeah, I have expected her to like be thirsty and like take a try to drink and like Jack and slap it out of her hands and shocky like that. But I'm glad that we didn't get that. Of the gods that were portrayed, um, what was that twisted, weird looking one? Was that supposed to be the drowned god? It's the drowned god. The, yeah, yeah, they the mentioned one with the, the seaweed hanging off of it. Yeah, it's all weird looking. And uh, the night lion, right? Mm-hmm. There was a night lion as well. Didn't you notice the, the night lion as well? I might have missed the night lion. I did notice a lion. I didn't know it was the night lion. Due to well, shameful what, what, ignorance. What, what, did it, what, did, what would it have been otherwise? <laughs> Which religion is that? The cowardly I, lion. It's, it's uh, <laughs> from E.T., I think. Oh, the lion of the night. Oh. Yeah, the night lion, lion of the night, night lion, whatever. Hmm. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you, Wikio, for Eyes uh, on Fire. <laughs> So basically, you know, we have Arya wanting to do more, but she's still wearing Arya clothes, so she can't do anything until she gets rid of those clothes, which I was super happy when she finally did. We're also introduced to, I believe, the Waif, even though she's not really Waifish. And I think she looks exactly like Lena Dunham, but I don't know if anyone else sees that. But what did you guys think of her wanting to play the face game or the game of faces but the girl is not slap you in the face game <laughs> yeah, yeah it's their know. version I of Rochambeau tits or tattoos yet so <laughs> can't compare to Lena Dunham did you guys think that the waif was drinking the blind milk based, based on the way she was walking around because she did seem to have I mean maybe she's doing some weird no no one walk but it seemed I, like that might be what's going on I thought on. she yeah, was did look blind but yeah, she's, I, I went back and I was like she's not blind in the books I know they, they can do that to you know to make him go blind but then she's like talking to her but she just seemed to be staring off into space a little bit yeah, yeah. I, this is just a way to set up it happening to Arya, I think we can take that as yeah, it's gonna she's gonna do that, which makes sense because it's like the most ninja y thing she does. So yeah. Everyone uh, in the temple is you, oddly aloof. Well I did thought it seem that, like she was breaking the rules and being sneaky by going to pick on Arya because then like Jack and shows up, she's like, Oh, I wasn't doing anything. I'm I'm not doing anything wrong. But it seems like she should have been either had permission to do that or she's just trying to be a bully. It's kind of a odd thing. Yeah, I think she was trying to be a bully because, like, you know, not even kind of acknowledging her. Not that she's blind, but, like, you know, who's this person? Like, I don't need to look at her. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Maybe she's secretly in love with Jack. She was like, who are you? You get here and you're like, you know, captain of the Quidditch team and you get into the Triwizard Tournament and, like, you know, like, what the hell? Yeah, but she's got nothing to be jealous of. She's Ron Weasley. <laughs> no, but she has this link to Jake. Maybe yeah, that's, that's true. Maybe she, maybe she's jealous. Arya's taking taking over her place as the favorite of Jack of Jake and. Too late, honey. I, th- I think you guys are reading too much into it. <laughs> what us? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you it's say gonna, such a thing? Sir. There's going to be a whole oh, Mean sorry. Girls subplot in the House of Black and White. <laughs> I'm in. I can't wait. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do get the sort of iconic scene. It's one of you know my the scenes that sticks with me from the books is Arya, you know, letting go of everything but not letting go of Needle. And I thought this was just an amazingly acted scene, even though there were there was no word spoken. I just really enjoyed it, and I didn't really think for a second that she was going to let go. But did you guys? <laughs> did anyone think they were actually going to going to change that and have her toss Needle into the water? Yeah, I kind of did. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's why I really like this episode. Just because of her acting, like you don't get the inner monologue that like. Uh, you know, Needle represents yeah. Jon Snow and Winterfell and uh, what, whoever made this sword, uh, Mickin. 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 Yeah. yeah, like all those things. It was just like you just saw it in her face. I don't think that non-book readers probably got that. But like in my head, I was like reading through like that book that inner monologue like from the books like when she was doing that and it was great i think that they you're right they did a really good job between the music and and her and her acting i think it it definitely came across and i can't imagine them doing something different with it because it's such a huge deal right this is the thing she's hanging on to this is why she will never fully be no one and i think that's gonna end up being pretty important right that's gonna be maybe drive some kind of action later i'm still confused how she thinks she's gonna get one over on the faceless men but yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I was in her position, I would just assume that they're watching me every second that I'm outside of the temple. And, you know, the fact that she just walked around and stuck her sword in a wall. Maybe they're planning for it, and that's why the rock had such a conveniently shaped uh, crevice for her. <laughs> sword in there. Well, it's smarter it's than nice. in the books. In the books, she hides it in front of the temple. She hides it under the steps, right? Yeah, like yeah. under a cobblestone yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 I really like the wave's accent. That's like a weird thing. And she wasn't mm-hmm. wavish, but I thought like the way she delivered her line sounded very like foreign and interesting. Danish? Sure. Yeah. Patrice is British. So 
It's, uh, it's the same thing. Accent. It's the same light British accent that yeah. they give to um, pretty much everybody. European accent. It's pan European. Oh, God. Yeah, it's the same <laughs> thing. Every <laughs> single European yeah. country has the same <laughs> accent. <laughs> I have heard that. But every state in America has a very separate and distinct accent. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> of course. Jersey. <laughs> yes, we all know the pirates of New Jersey. Uh, uh, good old Jersey. Maybe that's Jersey in England. <laughs> yeah, it's Sarlador San. New New Jersey. All right, everybody yeah, pick Jersey. an accent and stick with that for the rest of the show. <laughs> so now we're going to go to King's Landing. <laughs> you got it, Greg. Good segue. Forget uh, we about do have the, the last scene of, of them actually washing the body. All right, get out of your systems, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the last scene in the House of, of Black and White is them actually washing the body of the guy who who died there in, in the uh, the first scene. But it, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, the whole point of them giving care and like taking care of the body is that they get to cut your face off and use it once you're dead. Isn't that what happens? Yep. I get the sense. Okay. Presumably. So, so hopefully, you think that's the only reason? Well, one of them. Yeah, I think that I think that they honestly do think there's some importance to the whole like offering people, I don't know, like the, the loving embrace of death aspect. But I think there definitely is also the the ulterior motive is a major part to you know collect some faces. Well, so the people doing it, they almost, I mean, they would kind of, I would maybe think that they feel that they get to live on after they die. The fact that their faces are still going to be in the world if it's even if it's oh, used to uh, kill people. You think they know? Yeah, I didn't think they well, knew. I, think they, have I didn't to think, know. think they knew. Well, in this world, no, right, everyone it's, it's, knows it's, it's, this is this it's, temple it's, of the faceless men, and everyone talks about the faceless men every minute of the day. So that's true. But they don't know about the faceless men's magic. I guess if they saw a faceless men that looked like their dead family, then they would re- get make the connection. But otherwise, they don't know that they're taking on dead people's faces. Well, that's why they don't kill people that they know. Well, I'm saying pe- regular people in Bravos, their mom goes to the house of the undying, and then a week later she shows up as a faithless man. Well, they wouldn't use the, your mom's huh. face to you. You know, they'd no, use but your if mom's you were, face in, in Old Town. No, if you saw them walking around going to talk to someone else and you mm-hmm. just happened to bump into them. Maybe it's just like an unknown room. Like everyone thinks there's whispers of it, and if that's something you can cling to, mm. I don't know. Yeah, I like it because I mean they have to do some stuff around or, around the local area, and a little bit of that would happen eventually. Did anyone uh, think that? No, it's pork, honey. Don't worry about it. <laughs> From the books, when uh... we were all thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> I do so hope what? they do the blind thing, but I don't think they're going to. Oh, At so in the, not now. In the really, books, uh... you don't think so? Okay. I th- I was convinced. I mean, yeah, maybe the the waif isn't isn't blind, and it's just her being a, like aloof, like was being said. But I I thought that was a clear establishing that they would do that because I I think that that's like the big training that she does, right, to learn how to move with while blind. They're I mean, not going to do like the working in cat size thing, I don't think. But I think they're going to do the blind thing. I mean, what else would they do other than a blind thing? There's not too much stuff that we read from the books. I mean, they could make stuff up, of course, but... They'll give her some Rocky training montage, you know, just <laughs> drinking, like, blood or uh, some sort of eggs and... and, and Upside-down sit-ups, running up a mountain, yeah. punching they're, some They're going to need to add more steps to the temple, then, if they're going to pull that yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can move on to King's Landing. Does anyone any, anything else to say on Bravos? Mm-hmm. All right, so let's get to King's Landing, and... I am completely stupid because I completely forgot that Tommen and Marjorie weren't married yet. So when this wedding scene happened, I was like, wait a minute. What, wait, this already happened, but it was the other wedding. So Who's going to die? I thought they would have <laughs> led up to it a little bit, but we just opened it up. They're married. But uh, it, mm-hmm. it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was something to see. I just feel like everyone there must be tired of having to file into the great step. Like either someone's dying, someone's getting married. Like, just give them a break. <laughs> yeah. Like everyone's got we their only places. Ever, we only ever see each other at weddings and funerals. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I kind of felt like the, the the set was bigger this time. Do they have like an uh, like a um, like a main chamber for weddings and stuff, and like an antechamber for uh, funerals or something like that? Depends which one you which one you rent out, you know. Yeah, yeah. How much you're donating <laughs> much to, the, to the to the church? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, to be fair, they they film the set differently for those kinds of scenes, right? So when they're doing the wedding, they're at the altar at the back of the room, so they can look down into the middle where there's all these people. And when there's yeah. a funeral, the the pyre 
or uh, whatever the term is, is in the center of the room. So all the attention is drawn into the middle. So it seems more closed. Also, they use lighting effects to no. to simulate that. And also, to be fair, I think they probably expanded the set just due to what I think are going to be more scenes in that, in oh, that yeah, building. It's going to be a, a focus going forward. Yeah, with the high it's, it's not just going to be like marriages. It's going to be Cersei and the High Sparrow. And, yeah. Septi and Ella. I know they cast Septi and Ella. So wait, wait. Really? Yes, really? Okay. Yeah. Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, well they, can't have, they, they, they can't just have, like, Lancel do all the stuff that Septon, you know, did. I wouldn't so. complain oh, if they had Lancel in every scene. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, lo- they love to combine. Oh, yes, they do. It is known. It is known. So Tommen mm-hmm. has his awesome marriage night where he just wants to do that all day, every day. Oy, 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 oy. <laughs> oy. He and yeah. Pod, like, went to the same high school. I think uh, Mar- Marjorie might be, uh, you know, uh, playing it up a little bit just to make yeah, it Yeah, I think. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, yeah, I didn't want to say I don't that. know, like the four times you... in a night? Come on, man. Uh, right. That's, <laughs> well, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I mean, right, he's, he's both a stag and a lion. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah but 17. it's a lion. Four one-minute one segments isn't all that great, I would say. <laughs> uh, I think you're being enough. generous. It's quantity, <laughs> not quality. Yeah. He's 17, so he has the stamina for it. Is that how though... he is in a show? No, so the way. actor is. I don't know how old the character is. Yeah, it's good. Uh, he's that. eight in the in the books. <laughs> uh, well, they don't. Yeah. They don't have sex or a big wedding in the books. I mean, well, it's just like that's one of the major. Just the fact that they aged him up isn't the issue. It's that in the books, the whole thing with like her, her trial is that she's been sleeping around where she hasn't consummated her marriage yet but in this one there's no doubt mm. about that so that's going to be tougher for Cersei to prove you know is she, is she cheating when you can't just say she's well, cheating well Marjorie is not the one going on trial in the show it's going to yeah, be I, don't, I, I think that's just ignored right oh in the show you don't think they're going to try to play that up because that's what they're going to do Loris um, oh no gonna, no but what do you think Cersei meant when she told the High Septon that you know there's a there's a uh, sinner in our midst I, I assume that's who she was talking she's about. talking about Loris <laughs> oh. I guarantee it you think I guarantee you. Mm-hmm. Right, I, I can see you that. guarantee it because you know because you've watched ahead, or you guarantee it because you. No, just... I haven't watched ahead, but you know, in the preview, even the the high the high sparrow says he says, um, I hope. But he says he addresses them as a he, uh, whoever it was. So. I mean, maybe he's assuming. That would be a really but, interesting. Way but to they've take been it. setting up Loras this whole time. To oh be no, I know that, but I, it would be yeah. doubly impact, doubly impactful if they used her as well. Maybe, yeah. or maybe even just like they start with her and it's like dismissed quickly. Like who, Cersei, like tries to pin things on her. Who who would Cersei pin on her though? Because all those people that uh, that that was pinned. Marin, by, it's on gonna Marguerite. be Marin Trant. <laughs> she could, yeah, she could just be like, okay. <laughs> Nobody would believe that. How, how did you know it was that Kingsguard? It was the only Kingsguard who we ever see his fucking face. That's how we knew no, it was him. It'll be the hot Kingsguard that has always been helmeted. <laughs> <laughs> he reveals himself. suppressed and green. Green. Blowing <laughs> He pulls off his helmet. He's got like Fabio locks just waving in the wind. It's the first, it's the first actor <laughs> yep. from Who Played Dario. It's actually that Kingsguard. Sir Charming. <laughs> Sir Sudley. So did what are we talking notice? about? I don't know. But did, <laughs> did, You're the one did, talking did, about hot Kingsguard. Yeah. But yeah, I was just notice note that uh, apparently uh, we for one of for the first time I've ever seen uh, saw church sanctioned statutory rape essentially on uh, on a show I think so that's uh, well they, that's they don't a, have the same laws that we do <laughs> there's no law that you have to be 18 to have not to have no, no, yeah. sexual sex that, Tommen that, seemed perfectly consenting in all yeah of those <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the problem if you're under. And they weren't having actual sex in real life. It's not like that actually happened. So I don't know. It's too far. I mean, yeah, I was a little weirded out at the beginning, and especially since, like, at the start, like, I mean, we're thinking of Tom and a lot is like younger than he is in the show, but but I mean, it's fine. Like, there's no like actual like weird badness going on. No, 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 no. I I completely agree. It's not like it's not like that. It's it's just I feel like it's the first time I've ever seen on like an Amer- American show they doing something and trying to make it feel well at least not completely repulsive uh when they when they portray it so so that's something at least yeah they, they didn't have prince repulsed. hansen come out of the uh, uh, at the end and talk to cersei i mean talk to marjorie about her um proclivities like on yeah. deadline where they to catch a predator <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah i was just i'm just saying thing saying it's the first time i've seen like it's, it's not statutory rape in, in their culture, but it's still in, in, in American culture and stuff like that. So that's it's just something to note. Yeah. Well, that's why it? like all the actors apparently are 
18 or over when they're talking about it because otherwise it would be through the censors like unallowable yeah much. i mean they didn't have an actual sex scene i think because tommen's actor is only 17 like if they they couldn't have done that obviously to have like them actually doing anything well it obviously didn't strike a chord as much as the the jamie and cersei did because it was not front page news on the new york times <laughs> on monday morning no we'll get that later with sense I think it was more, I don't know, I wonder if, like, for show viewers, it was like, oh, that's weird, but whatever. Whereas for me, I still think of Tommen as, like, a child, right? So it was, it was like, really whoa. Weird. What also would have been weirder, I mean, it, it, would have, it wouldn't have been as weird if, like, the four episodes ago, last season, where, like, Tywin was literally talking to him, like, do you know what to do? Like, he had no idea, and it, it was... Let me tell you how to do it four times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the, the show Tommen is so divorced from book Tommen, like, just yeah. completely different characters. Oh, well, he's yep. even divorced from show Tommen from two seasons ago. <laughs> yep, right. <laughs> yep, literally well, a different person. <laughs> First season, Tommen, where he was sitting at Winterfell with uh, Tyrion, doing like a cute little kid. Yeah, yeah, grew up really fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but we do get a lot of awesome exchanges between Cersei and Marjorie. A lot of jibes, and I got to the point where I was like, "All right, Marjorie, tone it down a little bit. You're 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 doing a little too much." She she calls her mother and offers her morning wine, and like in the same set sentence, it was it was great to see Cersei having no choice but to take it. Like she's really got no one else to back her up there except for the nameless Lannister guards behind her but I've really enjoyed uh, their little you know, repartee and just having there it is so, yeah, yes there was repartee. Yeah. Ding. <laughs> so so do you think that uh, that she actually lost that that uh, little duel or was it actually intentionally that she let her um, let herself lose it's tricky I think she's definitely playing up Maybe a little bit of her powerlessness, but I think there definitely is the sense, and I, I thought this was actually really interesting, and I thought Lena Headey did a really good job with this, that, that Cersei really does feel backed into a corner right now. She's, she, she genuinely feels that she's kind of powerless right now, that, that all of that she had has kind of been taken away yeah. in the sort of swoop with, between Marjorie and Tywin dying and all this stuff. Um, and Obviously, she's hanging on to some things, but she she definitely feels desperate, and it's it's interesting to see how that's going to play out, especially, of course, later with the, the Sparrow and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, I disagree. With, okay. I think, like, she was testing Marjorie and just acting all like, you know, well, yeah, okay, like, I'll take all your jabs and just, like, feeling her out where it's like, okay, what does Marjorie have in mind and what does she want to do? Mm-hmm. And she, and, like, you can see it in her face when she talks to Tom and later when he's like, oh, maybe you should go to Castery Rock, uh, Castery Rock. And she's Castery like, Rock Retirement Home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just see that she's just figured out everyone but the thing and is I, she, she talked to Tommen before she went to go see Marjorie and that talk with Tommen really let her know kind of the seriousness of the situation that Marjorie has him suggesting to her that she should go to like peace out of the capital and then she realizes that if she doesn't get involved then things are going to be really serious for her and then she goes to this, uh, talk to Marjorie after that and it seemed like she was kind of taken aback by this could go badly I need to be on my game and she was kind of flustered a bit but I you'd think she would regain her composure in due time I kind of felt like she was just playing possum making uh, making Marjorie feel like she wasn't that much of a threat anymore that she already had lost so that she could maybe get her schemes ready mm-hmm. felt like it's a like she was just playing marjorie so she could get like the breathing room to make the proper arrangements for marjorie to get booted off or something yeah, i like get that. that interpretation i just feel like maybe i mean maybe she's grossly mis- misjudging the high sparrow but i feel like making the choice to go do that and, and to enlist his help later is showing that she is desperate. I feel. I think that she's not. She because of the way that things went with Marjorie. She she's definitely um, not on good footing right now. I agree with that. Every, I think everybody's right in a sense. Yeah. I think it's a combination of all of these sort of things. Because he she is powerless now. She she has a bunch of yes men. Like uh, I mean, there's Kyburn, but Kyburn has no real power. There's Pycelle. Pycelle is nobody respects Pycelle, and that's pretty. And Tommen is sort of being taken over by marjorie then what does she have she's approaching marjorie really carefully there and testing out her intentions while not showing her hand 
Well, I think the key thing is that she never really feels like she's powerless, right? Like, that's sort of in her character. Like, like she feels threatened. She feels angry. Even when, you know, things are getting taken away from her, or things are going out of her control, She's she, she becomes a bit irrational. She still thinks she's in control most of the time. I, I actually agree with Bing. You said that, Bing, right? That yes. She's, yes. she's, like, tapping. She's kind of testing out what's going on. I don't think she was definitely... Like, I don't think she was in control. I do think there was an element of Cersei being on the defensive there and i i also thought lena haiti did like the best acting i've seen from her in a while just yeah. because her face was like so subtle and like yeah. the little twitches and like her voice i thought it was amazing um but yeah i think it's it's very complicated to see what's exactly going on there and i'm not sure yeah i, th- I think she's definitely testing out i think she was also taken aback by what happened and I love that that thing. I mean, talk about Mean Girls, like when she's walking <laughs> away and like she can hear them laughing at her, and it's like, oh, sister, I've been there, you know. <laughs> yeah, it seems like she's more isolated and even more in the show because she doesn't have like a Lady Tanda that she can go back to and, and have her little conversations with, or yeah, she literally just has Marin Trant and Kyburn. That's really the only people, <laughs> and I guess Mace Tyrell. Uh, he's not I mean, really a, <laughs> a strange. Mace Tyrell is just a, w- a wetter vein. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody can point him anywhere they want. <laughs> and of Marjorie's uh, laughing little friends, it, one of them definitely looked like Mira Forrester. Had her same outfit with the blue collar thing and wow. the same haircut. Well, they should the be wearing the same outfit. They right? exactly like Mira Forrester. Yeah, that was the That'd one in the back. Great. I think the one in the front and to the left was clearly Sarah Flowers. There, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've written them in. Well, actually, that character was a character in the, in the show before she was a character in the game. We're talking about uh, characters in the game that are you play as one of Marjorie's handmaidens. So <laughs> we're just trying to figure out which one we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You obviously don't play that game, Matt. <laughs> you can see. No, I don't. <laughs> now we move on to this High Sparrow, High Septon, and his uh, brothel proclivities. I didn't Hilarious. expect them to get get rid of him so fast. Like I knew they had to get rid of him at some point. I didn't. I thought they were gonna find a way to kill him because he doesn't he just die in, in the books and then they have to choose or there's like rumors that it, they might have had, had him taken yeah taken out. he dies during the riots right no, yeah that's the first that was the first, that was the first, first one, one. that's the fat one. Oh right 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 yeah yeah and there's the fidgety one that that cersei has killed that's yeah, the one that like Tyrion a... picked right that's the one that yeah. this guy is supposed to be well i guess this one is plump so it's maybe a combination of the two <laughs> Look, but i wasn't complaining <laughs> on body fat index or anything <laughs> Well, we got a good so, look. So. Yeah. <laughs> almost not too much, but... I actually thought that was hilariously, like, almost self-aware from the show's part. Like, if there hadn't been quite so many naked girls, it would have been more self-aware. But, like, it really was, like, poking fun at this guy and being like, this is absurd, you know? Ridiculous. And, like, I thought but Oliver in the beard to... playing as the father was the funniest thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's who he it, it was. It took I didn't me know a was second going. to figure that out. <laughs> but it's it's interesting that they're playing this for comedy, but it's a direct foreshadowing of Cersei's walk of shame, that which is how the sparrows apparently enforce justice nowadays, is make people walk around naked, and that presumably won't be a funny laugh, laugh, ha ha. So it's if weird she's that naked. Well, be, right? so, if she's not, it shouldn't be a funny right. thing. Well, no, I mean, I'm I'm just curious. Like, I don't... I don't know if they're gonna do that. I thought that well, there was talk about because they had the they used, there was there were yeah you or someone about her, who was her body double that she didn't uh, actually do it herself. Um, and there was they, also they couldn't do it in the church, right? Yeah, yeah. there was news like, that they couldn't do it in the church that right. didn't allow them to do it. The city government or somebody wasn't letting them do it. Yeah, makes um, sense. So he could uh, the high exception could actually possibly have chosen Oliver as one of his yeah gods <laughs> to worship. Could have judging by his. Uh, choices i don't think he uh that's that's in his particular taste yeah always, always the you maiden. never know <laughs> i don't think the father <laughs> the was on the face. <laughs> i really like all like i'm not so into oliver when he's like in bed with loris or whatever and like he's being all obsequious but like when he's being just this snarky businessman asshole i really like him so yeah, which one too. do you prefer ross or oliver <laughs> I mean, yeah, probably all of our because it wasn't like, why, why are you here? You know, like I understand why he's on the screen for the most part. Rodney. They're not trying to make him happen the same way they did with her. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. very few all of our centric scenes. It's he's there with someone else. It's not just, hey, it's that it's Roz again. Yeah. Well, it's very Roz much was a device of the show. Else. But Roz sort of tried to take over the story. Yeah, I felt like they were trying to fit her in. Like they thought she was a fan favorite for some reason. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was great. And they were just like, okay, we give up. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll kill her. <laughs> 
All right. You guys didn't like her? Fine. <laughs> we'll we'll sort of give her a little purpose and then get rid of her. She can be in the chaos ladder speech. We'll fit her in. <laughs> After that, we have the High Septon marching into the small council meeting where he's a little beat up and uh, a little worse for wear. And I really enjoyed this because it just showed how Mace Tyrell will literally do anything. And they have no one there to even open the door for him. They had to have Mace Tyrell open the door and let the High Septon in. <laughs> And he was happy to do it. I think his mustache is even curlier this episode than it was last time. I mean, that's his third title, right? Right. Door opener. Open master of doors. Master, master of doors. Of door <laughs> well, master of coin is responsible for ports, and doors are kinds of ports, so I guess it makes a certain amount of sense. I think someone must have explained to the actor who plays Mace Tyrell like who his character is, because I remember him talking last season like he was in the wedding, and he was like, I literally had no idea what was going on. I was just delivering these lines. But the costume like, I'm very, really I'm very cool. important and powerful. Yeah, exactly. So I think somebody must have told him, like, you are, like, the punchline of all the jokes in this scene. And, like, oh, my goodness, you know, um, when he was all shocked that the that the high septon was, you know, sleeping around. And then Pycelle. What, what is this brothel? What are these brothels you speak of, my good man? What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> nope, no, <there's> brothels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that 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 uh, line from Mace. It's really good. My favorite was Quiburn. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> <laughs> And conspicuously absent from a meeting is Kevin, so I guess we are led to believe that he really has uh, gone back to Casterly Rock. But I hope we'll see him again soon, sooner than, mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. It did. Um, I did think that transition was like a little bit awkward. This is such a small thing to pick on, but like you know, you go from seeing him like walking naked through the streets, and then he like opens, you know, the doors open, and he's like all there in his robes. And I was like, I'm confused about the timeline. I, I was definitely thrown by that as well. See, it was completely understandable because you know the first thing he did. He he didn't. He wasn't going to march into the small council movie. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, they, didn't, they seemed like those robes were thrown on in a hurry. He was still quite disheveled. Yeah. Maybe if they had done a screen wipe, I would have understood. <laughs> <laughs> also, timelines in this episode are very, <laughs> very funny. Yeah. What are you yeah. saying? They have complete control over the timelines, always. Well, interestingly, in this episode, we got literal dates, so it's going to be interesting to compare those. With yeah, I think they're going to regret giving us those specific, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like when George told them, told us how long the wall was and we could measure everything else by that. <laughs> I think they'll, they'll regret that. Yeah. I really liked, this is not going to be surprising, but I really liked Lancel in the, in the, in the you know, scene there. He's like, you're a sinner. You, know, you yeah. must repent. I was like, ooh. You know, I like this intensity. Yeah, I'm a sucker oh. for a good Inquisition, but uh, <laughs> and just the fact that they they're they're you know they're they're shorn they're they're you know bare bones and it's they they they're complete zealots. They're they're not doing it by half measures, and we know mm -hmm. that Lancel's going to be the sort of hinge that the the case rests on. I think. Yeah, but was it? Oh. at this point, right? Because like clearly the guy was uh, you know taking advantage of everything, and like nobody's sad to see him march through the streets. The sparrows are interesting because they're both pitiful and threatening. Like, you know, you, when we get the scene with uh, the high sparrow later, you know, they seem like kind of a, a very downtrodden group, but Lancel's scene does make them feel very threatening. Yeah, Lancel's an enforcer now. He was supposed <laughs> to be like the little wimpy guy, but now he's a big tough guy. Well, they needed to change him from being a poor fellow and a warrior son, and now he's a sparrow, so he wears many hats. They're all the same thing. Yeah. I, I, I also got different kind of, orders. <laughs> yeah, but I got yeah. confused reading it. So, how 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 do you expect the show viewers not to be the unsolved? Oh yeah, no, I don't really care. I'm just saying. <laughs> but of course, Pycelle did defend the High Septum because the the dirty old men got to stick together. Yep. So I did. Yeah. did well, someone has to minister to the prostitutes. <laughs> literally, oh, no. pros before hoes. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Who dare interfere with his affairs? It's just not right. Um. <laughs> We were praying. We were just praying. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> He's ministering. I minister to the high and low. <laughs> it was so awful. Uh -huh. Which actually like reminded me of that scene from Firefly where um there you know the where Shepherd Book actually is like yeah. they're in a whorehouse and two girls approach him and he's like ah and he's like they're like could you pray with us. He's like, okay. <laughs> All right. Spoiler. I'm yeah, you're spoiling Firefly. all the sci-fi shows of Lost Dude. and Firefly. Jeez. <laughs> if you haven't watched Firefly by now. Yeah, it's too late. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's thirteen episodes. Get on it. Come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's an afternoon, too, gentlemen. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um. So then we move on to Cersei going into the city, getting her feet dirty, and trying to find the high sparrow that she's heard so much about. Um. This was the scene that I think a lot of us had seen many times. It was shown in a lot of the trailers as sort of like little previews, and. I mean, I we knew who this High Sparrow was going to be, and I, I love Jonathan Price as him. But I feel like any time they show like the like when Marjorie went to the Sept, you know, a couple seasons ago to to give the bread to the poor people, like I just imagine that every small folk in King's Landing is just like in pain, sitting at a table crying all the time because they have nothing else to do. Like that's all we see. But like these people have to be heavy jobs, unless these are just like the great unwashed masses who are you know displaced by the War of the Five Kings. But I, just, I think that's what we're led to believe. I yeah, that was that. my interpretation. All right, but yeah, yeah. Riverlanders. <laughs> the unemployment rate is just ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, in the books, they say, like people keep flowing into the city like yeah. constantly. That's that's a big issue. Mm-hmm. Well, they mentioned that in at Tywin's funeral. I think he said like, "Oh, they're they're spilling into the city and blah blah blah." And that's literally what the that's actually what they said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blah blah blah. Boom. I mean, that's literally who the poor fellows are, right? They're just people led into the city by the high. I mean, in a show, people led into the city by the the, the high sparrow, who bunch of poor yeah. people. Yeah. Of course, we don't get that in the show, though. He's he's just there, and we don't mm-hmm. get his backstory. Which I maybe we'll get his backstory when it goes forward. I have a feeling they're gonna throw in parts of Septon. Um, I always forget his name. The the one who met with Brand. Maribald. Maribald. Yeah, Maribald. Yeah. I think they're gonna like give him some of his badass. Lines. Oh, if we get the broken man speech, oh, just... that would be great. I want. That's so, really like, that's, uh, so good. And it's weird uh, for me because like Jonathan Price is playing the High Sparrow in this. He's playing Cardinal Wolsey in Wolf Hall, and he looks exactly like Pope Francis. So it's this like, amalgamation of like <laughs> awesome church yeah, people. Yeah, but he died church... in Wolf Hall. Don't oh, spoiler alert, jeez. Oh, oh, that's that's history. Serious. It's no. It's no. <laughs> it's yeah. Oh, that you, you can't, can't spoil. spoil. Fi- no one Americans don't know English history. Jeez. <laughs> Gotta keep editing that spoiler alert in the beginning. Yeah, I already have six times. Spoiler for Wolfhaw and Firefly and Lost. History. Yeah. Spoilers for history. <laughs> for history. Uh, the most interesting thing I thought about this scene, and kind of it's it's similar to what you were saying earlier, uh, Stephen, about how there's a clear divide between the way that the High Sparrow is acting and the way that the you know uh, Lancel and his crew are kind of, of, of enforcing things and I think that what it shows to me is he's, he's being kind of dishonest about his intentions here I think that he's putting on this kind of front I mean maybe he doesn't think so maybe he's not recognizing this but it seems like he's kind of putting on this front of generosity and you know being open with the people when he when he's not willing to condemn the actions of the more zealous people he recognizes it but he doesn't like do anything to make it not happen I think it's possible even that that, that was on his orders that happened I wonder if uh, the average viewer sees the high sparrow yet as a threat it's, you know, it's interesting so. that the show frames it right after Lancel's attack on the High Septon, but I wonder still if they don't see him as like this gentle man who's going to reform the church and for whatever reasons, right? But like it's going to turn, and I don't think the High Sparrow is necessarily going to be a you know a quote unquote evil character in the show, but he's a zealot. And zealots yeah. have a way of taking things to a, an extreme that is just horrifying to those that don't conform to their belief systems. I think right now they're putting all the more extreme actions on Lancel and the more uh, extreme behaviors. He's the one with the threatening sort of words to Cersei. He's the one who actually marches into brothels and beat up people. But I think it's, it's a clear smokescreen, at least on the part yeah. of the showrunners. Yeah, they're trying to show him as this like kind guy mm-hmm. who doesn't have any you know negative intentions. And I think that that's obviously, like you say, uh, Steven's going to flip pretty soon. It's crazy that Cersei thinks she can control the sparrows and the high sparrow. <laughs> yeah, well, this Ob- shows, obviously. again, how how delusional she's becoming. Which is, Right. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. But, I mean, she doesn't re- know right now. You know, I I, I think that, like, it's... it's uh, we we're having a little bit of hindsight bias here because, like, he's not even... Like, he even rejects the title. You know, he's not... I mean, obviously, you know, she's way more trusting than she should be, but, but like, I don't... I think know, there's he's a- not acting like a leader you know i think there's a real logic of why cersei wants to go to him because if you remember back to season three what makes marjorie so dangerous the main thing is that she the people really love her and now if cersei appeals to the 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 the, 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 the faithful that rips away from when one of marjorie's main power bases yeah but and there's that, a huge problem in that lancel is with them and he knows well, too yes. much <laughs> oh yes but and she's not thinking that way she doesn't think of lancel as a threat i guess yeah. and cersei kind of gets unlucky because the High Sparrow is kind of a singular person in that he's so incorruptible and focused and single-minded on his mission and kind of zealotry. Like, a 
lot of people could be bribed and connived and yeah. like they want to get power and then she could work with that kind of person that wants to just rise high and be a mm-hmm. kind of a figurehead leader person but he's not into that and it's kind of hard to, to predict that would be the case yeah i don't think she's completely uh off her game i mean completely off her rockers to pick i think she was she's just she just picked the wrong person to side with to side with her she also, I think, she thinks that he's as savvy a political or as as savvy a political, you know, player of the game as she thinks she is. If that makes sense, because like right. she's mm-hmm. assuming he's understanding all the subtext. You know, well, I'll do this for you, you do this for me. Where in reality, he's not going to do any of that stuff. It's going to go the complete opposite, and that's just going to be more, you know, uh, for her to fall, to freak out about once everything starts going down. Yeah, well, I think it makes sense because she has never met someone like this before, right? Someone that is so dedicated to the, their beliefs that they can't be bought, that they can't be. Twisted and they, they aren't savvy like that. They're just so single minded. So it's gonna be, come as a big surprise to her that they're that he actually is like that. Yeah, you're right. Even Thor's of Mur was, <laughs> well, corruptible. One, one might say. So. But the inter- yeah. interesting thing about all that is how she so easily dealt with Ned when he was so honorable and focused on his main mission that he wouldn't be corrupted and stuff, and she easily outplayed him. Well, wasn't it Littlefinger that outplayed well, him? there was more people. All kinds of people were taking advantage of Ned, but she was one of them that was outmaneuvering him. I, well, I think the Sparrow has more more power. He has all these people, right? And he's, he is. he's well, going to end Ned up having... Well, had a lot of power as Hand of the King, but... But, in the, he, but he had it. power in, in a vague sense, you know, the whole, like, power resides or, you know, he didn't have actual power. He just had his, his small group of guards he didn't have any actual you know anything behind him really nothing to back it up yeah i, I would also recommend looking at Stephen atwell the guy behind the race of uh, race for the iron throne blog you know a lot of his summary of cersei is she didn't like cunningly outwit ned she was really bold and actually made really key errors and it could have gone horribly for her if not for like a few breaks of luck you know i kind of accept his analysis that cersei just got lucky and ned just got really unlucky in very key moments so i I wouldn't attribute it to their relative skills at playing the game of thrones yeah and she felt like Ned, ned had the upper hand for a while and then well, he trusted in the wrong people. Mm-hmm. He trusted Cersei to do the right thing, so of course he trusted the wrong people. And, and Littlefinger. <laughs> yeah. And Littlefinger. Little so then we, before we leave King's Landing, we get to really see the inside of Kyburn's uh, laboratory a little more than we did the last episode, and the body on the table was not exactly hidden in this scene, as we find out why later on. Did you guys have any theories as to what the letter said specifically, or was this device just used as showing that Littlefinger, she thinks the Littlefinger is in the, in the Eyrie? Because she says, make sure Littlefinger is clear on the meaning of the word immediately. I think it was like, come back, I need money. I figured it's that, uh, yeah. or come back, I need you. <laughs> because I have no, <laughs> nobody here at the moment. We all remember that scene where she corners him in, in King's Landing and basically threatens to kill him, so I don't know how she'd expect him to really come back and help her out. Yeah, power this is, power. is right. It's a lot like going to the High Septum, right? She's trying to build, or the, the High Sparrow, it's about trying to build a new political coalition to resist Marjorie, Marjorie's control over the small council, or Tommen at least. Yeah. Why yeah. Littlefinger would help her in that mission, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that she sent it to the Vale and he received it at Winterfell. So she like doesn't know that. two hours later. That, uh, yeah, apparently. <laughs> they have really fast runners in the Vale. See, I'm going to defend them. I'm going to defend them. We don't know how much they could have been there for two weeks. We don't know, right? Yeah, that's true. That's right. Why are they just having that conversation now? Also true. Said, we had to walk around and see the, the, new, the new old home. And didn't, Sansa, <laughs> and didn't Sansa wear the same clothes she wore when she oh, arrived? Oh, we're really complaining about characters wearing the same close over and over again everyone has one well, outfit <laughs> well i would i would mention that a, that she is actually a highborn lady and she would wear different clothes clothes sets of clothes she was Ariel, before until she started mourning now she's only wearing yeah. the same clothes and this time she was wearing the same cloak as littlefinger they had the exact same thing on i noticed Weird. they had the same fringe and everything yeah. oh god he's so creepy <laughs> yeah you're catching cloaks <laughs> <laughs> Peter file. Yes. Anything else about Kyburn and, and this little fun little horror scene we got, which I I knew it was coming because I well they're, I'm thinking why are they staying there if nothing's happening and I'm like I think his his belly's going up and down and but I still jumped the freak <laughs> out of my out of my seat when he finally did that. But just his creepy line of, of easy friend is just oh it was perfect. Get they are yeah. using it fantastically. Like Get they're setting up a game ball. Cluck a game ball. No. <laughs> Do you think yeah. he was just killing rats for fun? Because what possible use could the rats have to his <laughs> bodybuilding? Well, I think he was cutting the head off, so he's studying, yeah. you know, connections and 
I don't know, the things that blood travels in. Science and well, shit. Vessels and all that stuff. I'm not a scientist. He's going to make a, a giant a giant splinter from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, oh nice. He made, he's going to make another funny. Nice. Thank you. So did anyone else notice that like he just start breathing when Cersei left? Well, it wouldn't have the same impact if he freaked out while she was standing there. <laughs> she jumps and freaks no, out. No, I know, but like, he, kill it, kill he, it. like <laughs> when she it shut the door, fun. like you could see the sheets rising and then does its little freak out. He was playing hide and seek, obviously. That's what we all want to do. Didn't want it was one of my just favorite. I mean, not like a great scene, but it's. it's I think it's going to be one of the more memorable scenes from this from the series as a whole. Definitely one of the top creepiest uh, scenes in the whole show. Uh, that and maybe the. Uh, the uh, rat in a bucket. Oh. Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. I had no problem with the rat in the bucket. <laughs> All right. Well, you see, this, yeah. this scene yeah, well, you me read of... about Roman emperors for fun, so. <laughs> I'm not sure what those two things have to do with each other, but it sounded good in my head. (laughs) They weren't all Caligula and Tiberius. There were some good ones mixed in. Claudius, for one. But anyway. (laughs) I've heard he's a fool. (laughs) So we can go to Moat Kalen, which we never actually went to in the show. We just saw it. But I knew the fact that it was in the opening credits that obviously they were going to be there for a little bit. But I kind of felt it was a little bit of a red herring. But uh, it was cool to see. I, I'm always happy when they show Moat Kalen. And just because you always get to see the strategic location of it, how there's nothing else around it except for just the swamps and that one road going through. And I feel like they're always showing you there just to let you know that that's the one way in and out of the north. But um, Brienne knows how to just go right around it. Yeah. Well, you can go <laughs> round and round for miles. I think we're led to believe that maybe one or two people could get around Moat Kalen, but you can't take an army around Moat Kalen. Right. Yeah. She can get friends so, with Raid. So we talked about around. this on the Wolfcast. Geography wise, what, what, where is that cliff at? It's, it's the giant cliff that's right <laughs> above Moat Kalen in a strategic position to launch shit down on Moat right. Kalen. <laughs> yeah. Which, of course, okay. doesn't exist. <laughs> Cause, cause I looked at the maps and and like the maps specifically shows like Moat Kalen being surrounded on on the south side by miles and miles of swamps doesn't like show like any sort of typographical difference. Yeah, well, they don't so, have swamps in, in uh, Ireland, so they gotta use what they have, which is lots of <laughs> lots of grass places everywhere. Constantly. They just needed a way to show everybody in that one scene and to pan to them. You know, if they yeah, were they like wanted... hiding in the in the tr- in a in a in a behind a rock right behind Littlefinger, it wouldn't have been the same. <laughs> yeah, <awesome. laughs> <laughs> Hope we didn't see us. <laughs> yeah, I'm just making the point that if if you wanted a a, a non swampy area close to Mount Kaelin, you would have to it would have to be the north side. So why are they going to, to Mount Kaelin if they're already on the north side? I'm just uh, imagining, um, you know, like little finger and sands <laughs> up on this big hill, and then you pan up to an even bigger hill. <laughs> 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 and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> so Little and Finger and Sansa had a conversation. They did. I think it was about revenge. It might have been about revenge. I forget because they've never spoken about revenge before. So was this the one about? It was revenge? also about I secretly love you. And a lot of face touching. Yeah. yeah. I was like, he's not gonna kiss her. He's not gonna kiss her. Okay, he didn't kiss her. Remember, I'm your uncle. Wasn't as bad as the last time he kissed her. Yes. <laughs> he should just stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does, it, does it not still seem out of character that he's gonna go through with this? Yes, it definitely. Does. Well, we don't know what he's trying to do. Yeah, yeah that's why yeah, I'm not exactly. saying it's like out of character. Because I mean, I still don't see why. Like, I guess why this is the most um, profitable match he could have made mm. for Sansa. But I guess you know, I'm 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 reserving judgment. I'm reserving judgment on a lot of things regarding Sansa. It, actually, I guess I think yeah. it makes sense in one way only is that if he's going to make a match, it needs to be someone far away. Right. And someone that could protect her. So like uh, they're saying, like, you know, the, the Lannisters aren't coming up here. Right. So th- that's like the only thing that make, would make sense about this. Mm-hmm. In the next episode, he's going to give her another poison necklace to wear at the wedding. So take out all the Boltons with <laughs> more all the Boltons and replace them with Sansa. Her? Like yeah. to do what? Rule the North. Queen of the North with him? Yeah. Yeah. That's I, all he wants. Why not? I've already like, given up on trying to understand Littlefinger's plan long ago. I don't. <laughs> I don't get this. Robin the Great Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I hope next season they recast him and they come back and he's like seven feet tall. 
Yeah. Talking, come in, come in and have like a <laughs> weird accent sub Sansa. <laughs> Looks like you missed out, huh? <laughs> How are you oh. doing? Yeah. Taylor Cousin. I, I, really I climb the giant's lance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, get it out of your system. Uh, anyway, I thought Sophie Turner was amazing in this scene, and I. I really liked the whole like the the conflict that he put her in, you know, the like the manipulation of it was was very impressive and you know, she really had no other choice yeah. but kind of still felt like she was making a decision. Um and Where she looks so good not, in dark hair. Yeah, and he says he's not gonna force her to do anything, but he kinda is forcing yeah, her to he's do fucking anything. Lying about that, obviously. <laughs> right. It's like so what, now we'll go back to the veil? Like no, you she know. did threaten to go all Lenny Hornwood and just starve her starve herself to death, but I don't think that was a, a real option for her. So here's the thing though. Do you guys think that she that Littlefinger knows I guess I'm skipping a little bit forward, but like he has that line like, Oh, I don't know anything about you, Ramsey Snow, Bolton mm. and you know, he's like, oh, yes, well, I'll treat Santa very nicely. Do you buy that? Like, does he, is, is Littlefinger making a massive miscalculation here? Mm. Or, like... I assume does... not. I assumed he, he only said that because he knew exactly his, the rumors that he's heard about him and, and like, how much of a monster yeah, he is. I mean, everyone he, knows. Yeah, but, but it's I, an I think it's terms... to say, though. Like, yeah, he, I think... he's almost challenging him by saying, like, I don't know anything about you. Like, otherwise, he could have just left that particular line of dialogue out and just said like oh i've heard you are a very brave person you know mm. yeah but i heard you're so, a stern so the problem... <laughs> <laughs> i heard you get people to pay their taxes yeah so, <laughs> so the problem with that is if if Littlefinger is, is leaving for, for king's landing he won't be there to protect sansa and if he knows mm. That sh- that he that Ramsay is as crazy and and malevolent as as he is, then he's essentially signing her death sentence. Oh, he's not going to King's Landing. Oh, well, he can't go back after marrying Sansa to Ramsay. He's, he can't go back to King's Landing. He's going back to the Vale to shore up his yeah. power base and get Robin, you know, even more under his thumb. So I think it's a little bit giving a little bit too much credit to Littlefinger to think that he ac- actually cares what happens to Sansa. I mean, maybe he does. Maybe the whole thing, like uh, even the, especially if it's different from the sh- from the book, uh, maybe he does care and maybe he really does want to protect her. But maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't care what happens to her. And I think the only way to understand what's going happen next with Sansa is kind of to look at the meta of everything that's going on because obviously they can't just have Sansa become another reek right they're not just going to do that she's going to there's something bad's going to happen and then she's going to escape somehow or take control somehow I don't think it's going to be murder all the Boltons like like people have been saying but I think that she will escape and obviously I think they're setting it up to be to be Theon with that but I don't want to talk too much about that right now yeah let's wait till we get there the other basic end of the scene is we get Brienne and Pod finally opening up to each other and telling all their origin stories which Pod's story is like that that's a really awesome story, but apparently it's actually from the book, which I completely forgot about. But that is yep. that is canon, yeah. which I really appreciated after I remembered that I appreciated it. So. <laughs> which Brienne story? That's not or... the books, actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> I, it was great. Yeah, Pods was pretty much right from the books. Brienne's, they, I think they combined like Renly. Renly visited Tarth at one point and was nice to her, but he wasn't part of that. Uh, the cruel, you know, he wasn't there the night that they were all vying for her hand and playing the tricks on her. But he, yeah. he was. He did treat her kindly. So they just combined that. But still, that was that. That was that was nice to to have her expose on. Yeah, but was there expose, a little like expose on? Expound. Expound. Doing expose. Expound. They had good repartee. Had good. <laughs> I wanted to make that joke. <laughs> Go ahead, good sir. <laughs> um, I was just a little bit annoyed that he said like he was squiring for someone during the War of Five Kings. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the War of Five Kings had like barely started when you like came to whatever, and I thought that it was, was like the first battle like of the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was like right. It didn't. The war did not have a name at that point. Yeah. So. I was a little annoyed just because I don't usually care about like the background details like that, but like this happened in the show. Like, come on, guys, you should uh, you should be better than that. I don't think so. I mean, wars are often named, and then the the history is applied after. To, to yeah. just, you know, like, did people who are fighting in Poland at a certain point, like, oh, this is World War One, you guys. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, after World War II. That's a special example, and I'm being a bit that. facetious, but, you know, the context for the war, you know, the War of Five Kings was never the War of Five Kings. Only four were ever active at once. But that's not how history will record it or, or yeah. for it to be remembered. Think- and it will start when the Lannisters started harassing the Riverlands, not when 
you know, the Battle of Ox Cross or anything else yeah. uh, occurred. I think it makes sense for him to address it like that in hindsight. They, they just think of it as that now, even if it was like the first thing that happened in the, in the war. Yeah, the period of instability at the end of Robert's reign is the War of Five Kings. And as if we needed reminding, because we're going to the wall next, uh, Brian ends up with saying how much he still wants to kill Stannis, which I always, you know, I love Stannis. I'm a Stannis apologist. And I think the fact that he went, he did the whole shadow baby thing. I feel like that's almost a thing in his favor in that he's regrets it and he's sorry about it. And that makes him a, more of someone to root for. Cause every time it's brought up, he's like, I don't want to talk about it. It's something shameful that he did. And a lot of people mm. use that as an excuse. The real question with Brienne and Pod, though, are they going to Greywater Watch to meet Howland Reed? Mm-hmm. Is that what the point of this weird side journey is? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that what be the Reed? Obviously, yeah. No, they're going. I don't think he exists in the show at all. <laughs> uh, he does. Jojen does he? Mention him. Jojen mentioned. Oh well, Jojen exists, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. head. Existed, so he must. Jojen and Mira hatched from eggs. I, I, I can see them. <laughs> I could see them not doing anything with it. Like Brienne and Pod will meet an old man with a long beard and a limp, and like it will never be referenced. And <laughs> book readers Stone will Stone lose Stone. their minds. The show is like, what a weird, creepy old swamp hermit, whatever. And <laughs> the swamp hermit. <laughs> Basically what he is. Interesting thing with the whole Jon Snow's mother thing in this episode <laughs> was that a lot of people were referring to the whole execution thing as like father, like son. And I was just thinking, no, fucking no, he's not his father. That's <laughs> Rhaegar. What are you talking about? Yeah, but he raised he's an adopted like father. Yeah. But is he though? Yeah. He the sentence and swing he's, the he's his father. Rhaegar's his father. Mm. <laughs> hey, R plus L equals J, guys. Come on. <laughs> so uh so apparently Brienne is completely she knows that that Renly was lo- that Renly liked men like it's yes Pat, yes Patrick he liked he men, liked men. <laughs> It was an open that secret was, at court. There's no doubt about that. That was awkward. I think it, it felt weird her saying that, but I thought it actually improved her as a character to me. I thought that it was really interesting, like the whole idea that she loves him despite that. She still loves him, and knowing that, I thought that was actually really powerful. Do you guys yeah, think book, who we love Zach. book Brienne knows? Yeah, or I don't. She's so, naive. I don't Does think book Brienne, Brienne know what knows. sex is? Yeah, I don't think book Brienne knows anything. <laughs> so, yeah. But that's yes. okay, too, because she didn't want to, like, you know, in, in book Brienne doesn't want, like, maybe she has dreams of marrying him, but she's not, like, she's not stupid, you know. She, well, she's a little stupid, but not, you know, in a good way. There's mm. a castle wall. There you go. No, that's, mm. that's, that's, <laughs> her. that's a reference. Come on. I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I just realized how much we have left to do. We're not even halfway done. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Oh boy. All right. We can do it. Damn you, Patrick. What? Sabotage. <laughs> I'm just trying to sabotage Greg so people think I'm better. I'm just <laughs> well, so if we go over much, two hours, much. I'm going to kindly ask you to edit this. <laughs> so I'm keep it under two. <laughs> that backfired on you, Zach. Jeez. All right, so let's head to Winterfell, where we get the awesome open the gate scene and Fat Walda greeting everybody because she's just so happy to see somebody else other than a Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> I just like how this this scene mirrored, you know, the original scene from the pilot where Robert and you know the, everyone's greeting the Starks. It's a great happy moment, and this one like nobody wants to be there, and it's just <laughs> dark and it's dirty, and there's Boltons everywhere. And <laughs> I hate the Boltons, but I love watching them on the screen. Not Ramsey so much, but Roosters. Michael Michael McAlatten who plays yeah. Ruth. Oh, it's just so such good. a pleasure to watch, and I could listen. I hope he starts narrating audiobooks soon because I he has one of my favorite voices ever. But he's just Bruce Bolton, so I hate him. So, what do you guys think of the Sansa's return and her kind of decision to play it cool and not slap him or spit on him? Oh, well, that look she gives him though that look like where she's like, yep. oh "My God, you killed my brother! Oh my God, you killed my brother!" Lord Bolton, you know, it's <laughs> so so great. I'm not a little girl anymore. She knows she's playing the game. <laughs> also, yeah. I'd like to point out that before they arrived, we had the scene where uh, Ramsey had played those people and he was talking to his dad about it and stuff. Yeah. Gross. Well, yeah, I think yeah. people. some people are making the argument that Ramsey doesn't have as much of a reputation in the books, so Littlefinger might actually not, as in the books, so Littlefinger might not know about it. But this is some pretty clear evidence here that, that they could get back to him. <laughs> but what, you're not they though, like, what does that mean, though? Like, what, what, you know, his reputation, like, how far could that reputation stretch? You know, they did like, take I don't... down the bodies before they, the, the, the guests got Yeah, but a bunch of lords are dead. <laughs> I think there's going to be some word about that. But Littlefinger doesn't 
doesn't know every vassal in you know in, in no, the but north. He, he, he takes time to learn things about people. That's part of his character. So yeah, I, I, I well, think he knows something. In the books, even in the north, Ramsey's bastard. No, pardon me, Bruce's bastard is kind of like vague rumor until he becomes a more prominent character much later in the series. Like there's there's tale that he's a very unpleasant and horrible person, but you know it's all kind of just rampant speculation until he starts. What is it like? His, his, what he does against the Hornwoods kind of first gets attention or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I could see how anyone outside of the North would be like, oh no, his bastard. The king legitimized him. Everything's fine, I guess. Shrug. It's a good yeah. kid. A little trouble. Not a problem. Just needs a bit of work. Yeah. A sociopathic has, has noble? Issues. That's so rare. <laughs> so Maria or Mariah, um, Ramsey's uh, love interest, does not seem happy. And I know there's been rumors about some scene that, you know, Alfie Allen said was just awful to shoot. And I never, I mean, I hoped it wasn't something with Sansa, but I have a feeling that it's going to be, Maria's going to be involved and she's going to be. Oh. Miranda. I, Miranda. Is it Miranda? I think it's Miranda. Miranda. There's an M Miranda. and there's a Y. So it's all right. <laughs> like every name in all of Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. There's some Y in there, <laughs> So you're saying that she'll raise a fuss and then Ramsey will be like, nope, you're out of here, lady. I don't know. Maybe like take out on Sansa's handmaiden, like that nice old lady who remembers the North. Maybe she'll go, which I hope not. I don't know. Mm. Oh, that, that line definitely. was so missed. Oh. I think she will try to kill Sansa and, and Ramsey might go in and be all chivalrous or something like kill... Uh, or the dogs. Kills the Miranda. dogs are going to come into it. Something's going to go down with the dog. Yeah, but in, in some sense, it's going to be like, well, it might be something like he, he pretends to be like this this dashing knight or something like that coming to her rescue. Be quite interesting. Yeah, and, and, and like, turn the tables, I don't think yeah. Sansa's going to fall for him no matter what he does. Oh, no. No, no, I, don't, no. I don't think so, but they're gonna. there's going to be a horrible scene, and, and that's going to be the catalyst for whatever happens next. And we know that. And I just hope it's not what happens in the books, because oh, that'd be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. If people were worried, you know, uncomfortable with Tommen's sex scene, I cannot imagine oh, yeah. coming close to that. See, yes. I, I, I'm still, you know, I, I know a lot of people were really disturbed by this and like really think that Sansa is going to play like exactly Jane Poole's, you know, uh, role in this in this situation. But I just don't see it happening. I don't think mm-hmm. I know Sophie's 18, but I don't think they're going to have her be nude. I don't like I'm not saying like horrible stuff won't happen, but like as Sansa Stark and actually Sansa Stark, she automatically has so much more agency than, you know, than Jane could even dream of having. I think that it will be tough for her for sure and probably horrible and disturbing but i'm not i'm also not like oh my god this is the worst thing ever you know Mm -hmm. this is definitely going to include like tons of rape and whatever she's going to turn the tables i'm like i mean something is going to happen that's going to give her some kind of advantage but i think at first it is going to be something horrible at least we know something horrible doesn't happen next episode because michael has already seen that one i actually haven't yet i haven't had to watch no well then so it could (laughs) i don't know we know there's Dornish in it. That's, yes. Finally. They better show up at some point. But I'm so surprised they waited this long. Like episode yeah, four, man. Yeah, they're actually man. taking their time on a character getting somewhere. I can't believe they're doing that. <laughs> well, no, they <laughs> could just... have they could have the Sand Snakes without Jamie and... No, they're not going to introduce major characters without anyone else. To Jamie play and Dark Star? <laughs> <laughs> Jamie and Dark Star. <laughs> So basically, this whole you know little bit ends with the cryptic conversation between Littlefinger and Roos about you know Roos actually is kind of flabber flub ugh, I don't know what's the word <laughs> flustered <laughs> he's flustered I'm flustered he's fl- he's flabber flustered that Littlefinger is helping him he doesn't understand his 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 motives and that's kind of meta commentary for the fans who also don't know him. yeah so they get the line you know the last time that the, the lords of the of the Eyrie and Winterfell joined they brought down the Targaryens and I mean coincidentally yes yeah. <laughs> There are no John Aaron and Ned Stark, but yeah, we'll, they also have the Stormlands and the Riverlands. But you know, whatever, we'll leave that aside. Simplifying, simplifying, simplifying. They obviously have some plan because the first thing that Littlefinger says is, "I've kept up my end of the bargain." So there must be a concrete thing that they're both going towards. But they just don't, they obviously don't trust each other yet, with good reason. Oh no, there is no trust. I mean, I I really liked that conversation that they have because they were both like, you know, it was like their internal response to each one was like don't bullshit me, says something. And then the other one was like, stop bullshitting me, says something, you know, and it was... Can't bullshit a bullshitter. Yeah, I also exactly. liked how they literally were talking on stairs, and when Roos was talking, he was a step up, and, like, he thought he had to step up on him, and then Littlefinger had to take a step back up to talk to him. It was... I really enjoyed that little... <laughs> what they were doing there. That seems like a musical sequence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. Stepping up. Don't you talk down to me. Him. No, you don't talk down to me. 
Good stage presence. <laughs> yeah. So did anyone else find it weird that Bruce Bowen knows that Rickon and shit, what's the other kid's name? Brand. 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 Uh, a brand are you remembered Rickon, but you forgot brand. <laughs> That's so uh, not what you I okay there. Expect. Well, be, uh, because uh, I mean, brand's like north of the wall. He's becoming a tree, whatever. Yeah. But Rickon and Rickon's is... in a fine dining place. <laughs> he's at a yeah, five star establishment on on Skako, so he's got nothing to complain about. I mean, this can also apply to the wall scene where he's like, "I need a Stark." It's like there are Starks all over the fucking place and a lot of people know where they are do they hmm. we don't know where Rick, we i mean the last time we saw rickon was what season three where mr a- mr he, he's going said, to last the last heart or last that's what they that's said her. but they could you know they could simplify it and have him show up at the wall or they could have him not show up this season because it's 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 up in the air we don't know i don't think they're gonna have, why would they have rickon uh, if they're not gonna i don't know i just I don't, don't see him showing up i just can't imagine but, them but, going to last hearth that some someone would have to go there you know maybe maybe davos but well, the army's apparently about to march out so maybe they never mind that doesn't make any sense no i don't know i don't think rickon's back this season no no, I, I don't think I think we know that he's not back this season, right? We know Bran's not back this season. We yeah, know they're not doing anything sense. with him. Yeah. So yeah. it's just weird that they're like there are no Starks. These are what we have. It's like no, Theon knows that Starks are alive. He you just know. noticed one more. <laughs> uh, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. We shall see. We saw some ravens being returned in cages so that they can't just fly back and forth. They have to be returned to where they came from. Still makes no sense. <laughs> yep. I just saw that as them stocking up on ravens that they've got you know, some messages that are going to be sent out. But yeah, I know there's the <laughs> the science of, of raven <laughs> communications. You have, to, you have to take a horse and bring them back to the place they come from. <laughs> so, <laughs> literally no sense. You could just have a fucking postal system. <laughs> That's, oh yeah, that's definitely the worst reveal Martin has done. Like, oh no, the Ravens can only travel one direction. No, that needs to, that needs to be they would just eliminated. Be millions of Ravens in King's Landing. Like, well, what do we do now? Because we're just stuck in King's Land. <laughs> How do well, you that, train that, them? Like, how do you train a bird to go from High Garden to King's Landing without bringing it back? This is a horrible, <laughs> horrible plan. It makes no sense. Magic, but, <laughs> magic, guys, magic. Oh, is, Blood Raven. Blood Raven is, sends is, them all. <laughs> It essentially creates a new prof- profession. You be the the raven, raven transporter. Husbandry. Yeah. But why so do you need raven in the first place? Instead of transporting messages, you transport birds. Just start the damn Pony Express already. Jeez. <laughs> but then, then you could transport like what hundred birds in like in a caravan down or millions to, of messages. <laughs> All the messages, <laughs> but, but you, you wouldn't get like a million messages at at one point. But you could, you could yeah, just, I don't know. I, I guess piles I piles of it logic on top of each other. Uh, we'll leave uh, Raven theory, theory theorizing till the till the after show. Technically, yeah, the, the Ravens have gotten a lot better since the dragons came back. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, so let's go to the wall where we Art. get another awesome conversation between John and Stannis, and it is confirmed that Ollie is John's new steward. And I would just I'm not confused, but do you, are we led to believe that Ollie is an official member of the Watch it, or he's like hasn't said his vows, or he's in like an odd position because he's a kid and they don't normally take kids? Well, I don't think he's in yet because because Stannis or was it Stannis yeah, or was it the Davos asked him specifically how the uh, the the saying went. So it can imply that he's he's um, training to to become yeah yeah uh, but didn't but Mormont yeah, he didn't hasn't make... gotten drunk and forgotten everything that yeah, he, he studied he said, <laughs> he said something like you you've you've you must have memorized the words by now right like you've oh, been here yeah. long no no but like Mormont didn't make John his commander until he was a sworn brother right he was just like a right. guy training in the yard and like a, a pl- John has a unconventional forms of, of leadership he's already reforming yeah yeah <laughs> he's taking on interns <laughs> he got real comfortable real fast in there he like he was behind the desk he was like oh he's my steward and yeah he seems a little too like, into it yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> And did you notice that his hair became a little less fluffy this, uh, this episode? Oh. I did not. He, uh, how long did you spend on that on Wolfcast, Patrick? And be honest. Oh, this, <laughs> I, I didn't actually use any time on that because I, well, 
I didn't have time for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have time well, here, now, though, he, of now he has a steward to brush his hair, so it's, it'll become <laughs> more man. I, still, I feel dresser. weird about this, because I feel like Ollie should still be mad at John about the, the whole Yagrit thing, and I feel like the whole Kill the Boy episode has a bunch of different possible meanings. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but he totally is mad, because when uh, John is like, oh, I'll, like kill all the wildlings no i won't do that and it pans to ollie and he's like you better fucking do that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm just waiting for it i'm just waiting for it <laughs> stan has put john in a really dumb position in this thing he was like you know you have to convince mance to like get all the wildlings to fight for me john was like well sorry i can't do that and then stan was like okay fine you have to get the wildlings to fight for me and John was like, I, just, I can't do that. And now Stannis is like, here, have the wild thing. <laughs> 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 okay, you know, he's lucky it's John. I also like that really passive aggressive, like, we can't feed you anymore. Please leave. Get the fuck out. <laughs> out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be fair, he is leaving in a fortnight, so... Mm. We're gonna see some action down at Winterfell. That's gonna be like episode nine at the at the at the soonest. It's gonna be a lot of marching in the yeah. snow until then. Yeah, starving and yeah, it's gonna be on the way. Yeah, there's gonna be like months and months in King's Landing and and everything, and then yep. and the then the fourth night <laughs> has passed. And but I did enjoy how the tides returned, seeing have, having John having Stannis to sit in the chair in front of his desk, which you know is what John had to do for the last three episodes. Yeah, I also like, I understand Stannis wanting him to accept. But but even though he didn't, like I still, we know he respects John and he respects his decision, even before the whole everything goes down with Jenna Slint. But I never thought he could honestly expect him to accept it because even, especially after he's become Lord Commander, he can't just turn back on that now. If he was gonna, he would have accepted before. Exactly. That was a really weird. Um, I mean, I guess Stannis like could have thought like, well, he didn't have time to accept my offer. They just made him Lord Commander. But like, yeah. no, now that you're like, Lord Commander, uh, how about my crappy offer? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I think that they just wanted to like reiterate, like, look, look at all the honor, everybody, and it was kind of an awkward way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. Look I at mean, all the honor. <laughs> John has the most honor. John is Zuko. <laughs> His honor level is over nine thousand. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> uh, yes, we get uh, Davos staying behind and having his little chat. As they're walking out, I was like, I hope Davos stays, turns around and has a chat. And I was so excited when he finally did. Do you think wow. Stannis' Davos is just, chats are the best? Do you think Stannis is just waiting outside for Davos to finish the chat and come and join him? He's just waiting at the door. Well played. High five. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Fist bump. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Greg, five with Davos, Greg, right? I mean. Yeah, Greg, you're, you're just such a fanboy, really. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but Davos is my, one of my favorite characters, and I'm happy yeah, to see him sure. on the screen. Yeah, and uh, according to stupid things, like listen, let me tell you something. You have to abandon your oath, or like the way that this oath has been interpreted for you know thousands of years, it's all wrong. Hey, uh, let me tell you. Sam tries to get him out of the sleeping thing, but he says, "Well, it says take no wives, but it doesn't say we can't have sex." So they're they're always interpreting. <laughs> That's like going to benefit. Loopholes, loopholes. Sex. No, but Davos, he's smart. He's I mean, I thought thought a bit differently. It didn't. I wouldn't agree with. I would if I was in John's position. I wouldn't have changed my. But to think about it a little differently, saying protect the realms of men. What do you, the Boltons are going to come up here and march on you with your fifty guys? And once we're gone, they could take you out. So he has to think but that, about that. But that literally runs contrary to the entire Night's I Watch know. philosophy that you don't involve yourself in the politics of the realm. But the realm involves yeah. itself that. in your politics. That's he's but they have to that. Why do they think that that's going to happen? Yeah, it hasn't even been you raised know. that the Boltons would attack them. Right. Yeah, and they hold themselves to a higher standard than the Boltons? than the rest of the realm. They, no, they, they, yeah, I just, I just don't feel like they would ever do that. They would ever, unless, of course, John flips his shit and tr and tries to do it anyways. Yeah, he would never do that, though, right? No, that's like never. insane. They, they <laughs> would like to over that. That'd be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that, what? Yo. Going to pursue a personal agenda, John Snow? Also, the thing is though, like the realms of men thing from Dance with Dragons, I always enjoyed. Right? That's John realizing that, like, hey, the wild. This refers to the wildlings too. It's ridiculous that we're just like only the Westeros people. You know, we're talking about all living humanity. Um, whereas this was just Davos saying I mean and maybe John will have this realization later but like right now it was just Davos saying like my king needs soldiers like how can I manipulate you into like thinking that this is part of your oath when it is ridiculously not and why would you waste Night's Watch men going to fight the wars of the realm which is why yeah, all 20 of them 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was just, I was not impressed with Davos in the scene. I was like, dude, no logic whatsoever. Well, according to Davos, Stannis, very much like Shaft, is a complicated man. <laughs> 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 and there's our opener <laughs> you win pod <laughs> so we can get down to the scene that we're all eager to talk about is Janus refusing his order to go to Greyguard and getting his head chopped off mm. which I we all kind of knew was happening but they're just they're breezing through so much of John's storyline because going into the season I remember counting the chapters like well, John has like 15 chapters to get through and now he's got like six chapters to get through <laughs> I don't think we're going to get the one where he checks the supplies oh my favorite <laughs> Well, you got to introduce Bo and Marsh, and it's got to be when they're in the yeah in the right, cellars. So. <laughs> He's just gonna be checking supplies with Ollie, and Ollie with his little checklist, giving <laughs> John the stink eye. <laughs> that means Ollie has to learn to read with Sam and Gilly and Shireen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird that they've they've mentioned. I'm reading that they cast Bo and Marsh, but we haven't. He hasn't been named in a couple of seasons. I don't think he's ever been named, uh, and he's definitely hasn't. We haven't seen him this season. They've mentioned all, you know first build of Yarwick several times, but we still haven't gotten Bo and Marsh. We have those people sitting beside. John, who are those people? <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Brian's one of them. <laughs> Brian, oh no, Brian's sitting down down there. That ginger. Oh yeah, yeah. dirty ginger. Uh, okay. Who I'm pretty sure didn't really have red hair. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> that line. Like, why does he not like gingers? That doesn't make any sense. After he all, he loves thing. gingers. <laughs> Egret and Sansa and all the people that he likes. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe it's the, sort of like a. Uh, you, you're allowed to say it if you know someone or it's some. Yeah. It's one yourself. <laughs> yeah, he can say. It. <laughs> He's allowed to say that word. <laughs> Um, I, th- it was interesting to me this whole sequence, um, like before we get to the whole like cutting thing. Um, just the idea that he he does seem like he's very into it to me. He seems like he's he's kind of like accepted the role and he's very much committed to it in a sort of sort of like lax sort of aloof way, which I feel like is gonna be the conflict maybe where, with the whole kill the boy thing. He's gonna have to rein this in a bit. Yeah, he's taking it. He's feeling like he's taking it very lightly, or maybe yeah. not taking it lightly, but he's 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 enjoying it more he's than he reveling. did in the books, at least. Yeah. Reveling in the power. Yeah, that's in the bo- strange. In, <laughs> in, in the books, he he doesn't seem like he's enjoying his job very much. Yeah, he never actually uh, smiles in the books at any point. I don't think when he's Lord Commander, just flexes his hand a lot. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> that's different. So the slint how it goes down. Yes, everyone is angry that we didn't get the Ed Fetcher block, which uh, seems like they made a very conscious decision not to give us yeah. that line for some reason. So this is one of those things where it's like it's not a big deal for me personally. A lot of people lost their mind, like on our Song of Ice and Fire, but I, I don't care. But it's like, why? Like, what is the reason the for only, not doing that? The only reason I Seriously. have is that Ed is not his steward in this. Ollie is his steward, so we yeah. could have said Ollie fetch a block, but Ollie get the sword <laughs> makes more sense for people that I don't know. You need a sword. Yeah, you know, and no one knows who Dolores Ed is in the show, so yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. that's. That's probably what they're in the writer's room. That's probably the reason they came up with. The bigger thing is that in the books, he he decides not to hang him. That's the initial plan. And he changes that, which is kind of a more obvious like show of like, I need to do this. But but that kind of doesn't work, I don't think, without the internal monologue. And I just it would be too awkward. I think that this the way it worked with this, especially with like him hesitating in the room before he walks out. I thought it it played really well. And there's a lot of cool things in there, like Alistair Thorne waiting and then stepping aside. Like there's a lot of cool stuff that makes it still yeah. really awesome. Yeah, there was a, a fascinating yeah, but... shot right before John left, where they had taken Alistair outside and John was alone, and he put drinks his thing, and then there's a shot of just the wall with John off screen, and it shows his shadow rising, and it was really in, an interesting thing about how his projection of power and how like this will reflect reflect on the men and how he's perceived by them. Mm-hmm. I found it to be a fascinating thing because it was so out of a thing that there was no character in the shot. It was just his shadow on the wall. Yeah. Found it very interesting. That's deep, man. That's, That's right. power, power right there. It's a shadow on the wall. Yep. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I would solved it. Uh, so, so don't don't you think that John might have normally kept his sword on him at all times? It is not, essentially. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but now he's a he's a. Lord yeah, Commander, he has someone else carry the sword now. Exactly. Why? why? Privilege of power. 
Who needs to carry a sword anymore? It makes it much more imposing when you have to say, "Yo, get me my sword." Fetch it. <laughs> like, like with, like with, bet, with Ned, bro. it makes sense because it's like you know he he was already armed, and then Ice is this giant sword. You know, someone else carries it for him. It makes a All little less sense with John, but I get it. Yeah, no, he'd fall over. I think he made the right decision, but just that the fact that they gave him that little second of, you know, at, mm-hmm. where he repents at the last second, and says, "I'm afraid, I'm afraid," and then he kills him after it seems like he's gone come down a peg. But you, you, there's no turning back from that point. He's disobeyed a direct order, and it needs to be done. But I feel like this is the I was trying to pay attention when they took Janus and like everyone started yelling. It didn't seem like anyone was defending Janus. They were all just like freaking out. But you can't really hear specifics of what anyone's saying. But I feel like this is going to start the divide between the people who yeah. think he's doing a good good thing mm. and a bad thing. So it's mm. it's already they started. really they really did complicate it with that that whole like begging for mercy and what looked to me like John sort of like in a fit of anger making it happen. And yeah, obviously it's a given. He had to do it. He had to enforce his authority. I think we can all accept that. But just the way it played out is gonna. I think caused problems for him and I was I was watching like like I guess Kit Harrington was like explaining on some video he was explaining like the logic behind it he did he did draw a comparison uh, to, to Rob Rob uh, executing Karstark and and how it, it part of it was kind of like this negative action like a fit of anger it was sort of motivating it as well so it's not it's not fully like a benign action I think that that's really cool that they added that element to it even though it's not as obviously big and epic that. and, and ju- righteous I, I didn't see that at all, honestly. Like when when you know, I think John was definitely angered when when Slint was like pissed off. But I really saw the execution as like you know, I mean, it was a power play, you know, and John didn't invite that power play. Um, and then you know, I mean, I said this on the forums, but like he he can't take his head off the block. Like he that, yeah. that all his power goes away, and you know, I mean. And it, it was Slint's own fault, you know, like he he didn't even he didn't cave until he was there, you know, and it was like maybe if like while they'd been dragging him outside, he'd been like he'd, he'd said the same thing, like maybe then. But I really, you know, I thought I thought that was just an interesting moment where you know he started to beg and John was like, oh, God, like you're making me you're making this even worse. I really didn't. And maybe I guess I'm, I'm wrong because if Ken Harrington, you know. Interpreted. Maybe he's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, I just didn't just see. Like, I saw. I thought he was pissed off, but I also thought he was like he wasn't. He wasn't doing it because he was like, "I'm so glad I get to kill you." I think. No, was, no, I don't think. Yeah, that. yeah, that and, seemed clear. And I, I, and I, I think, think it yeah, was. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. It has justified this action. He has to do it. I'm not disputing that, but I do think it that not everyone's going to maybe see it that way, and that is going to be a source of the issues John's going to have down the line. I read yeah, it more right. as a grim a grimace of resignation rather than a snarl of like rage or anger at him. It was like, wow, th- this is a more of a hard thing that you have to do than something that you're angry and you want to do. Yeah, that's, he can't even face it. Ticket. Like you know. And the other, and it is kind of him stealing himself, yeah. Because the other comparison that Kid Harrington makes is when he does not execute Yagrit back then, and this is him, you know, going through with it. So yeah, the grimace of resignation reading is is perfectly reasonable given that. Yeah, this this was one of my favorite parts uh, in the books for the Wall story. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I really like that they put it in there, and and I feel like yeah, it's it's not John's decision to. Put, to make this situation come, it's it's entirely slint that that provokes this situation. Well, that could be seen both ways because he gives him the you know the decision to go to Greyguard, and people could say that he did that knowing he wouldn't accept it, so he's pushing his hand that way. I don't but, think it's a bad position. You know, I mean, I I think I think also the latrine thing is directly contrasted there. You know, I don't think we're supposed to. Sure, it's not a great job, but. All Slint wants is a cushy position where he can, you know, suck up to Alice or Thorne all day, you know, where and John's like, no, you got to go work. Like he's making him the commander of the castle. Like, yeah, it's a crappy castle, but like it's something that needs to be done. I didn't, you know, I think Slint, un- unsurprisingly, was just being a complete idiot about the whole thing. And yeah, you know, he just doesn't get it. Like, right, exactly. I mean, he, cl- he it, never it, saw John as Lord Commander and he took the opportunity to be like, you are not Lord Commander. You can't yeah, make he, me do this. He signed his own death warrant there, obviously. Yeah. He wrote his own he, death warrant. Yeah. He made his bed, he slept in it, then he signed his death warrant, and then he, <laughs> then he executed himself. <laughs> yeah. Textbook. Metaphors. <laughs> See, I, I also thought it was just really interesting how it was contrasted to last week with Danny and 
you know, it was like, you know, the, the whole the whole color scheme is so different. Like that scene has, at least as I recall, very little music. And this scene has a ton of music. Like the music is, is a major part of this scene. Yeah. Um, and nobody was supposed, to be, nobody it's was supposed to be rousing and epic. And that one is supposed to be like a very, you know, like ne- downturn kind of like, oh, you made a mistake. But I wonder yeah. if that's maybe misdirection, because I, I do think that I, I obviously had to make this choice. But I do think there is going to be complications because of it. There better be. <laughs> <laughs> so. So did uh, Jano Slint get the longest neck hole exposure of any of the beheadings we've seen? It I seemed thought like we were going to make it through without saying neck maybe. hole, but thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like all the other ones cut away before this one did, and this one got you got to see a little more. It was more there for a solid they, second. They or lingered so. a bit, and we get maybe our stand It's easier to make a fake head if it's we did get the linger the lingering neck hole. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the the new name of the the Night's Watch bar. <laughs> Lingering <Nicole>. oh, God. <laughs> and we also get it before this all went down where we know that Maester Eamon is now sick, so we know that that's yeah. gonna, that's that My, was there for a reason. Everything goes as I have foreseen it. <laughs> 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 he will be sacrificed to the Red God in due time. I just no. know it. He's not going to die peacefully in his sleep in, in Bronx. No. Or not so peacefully. No, I just wanted to ask if you what people's uh, thoughts are on, on Mace Raymond. Is he going to go uh, on a trip or is he just going to nope. die here at the wall? Probably just going to die. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's too late to send Sam on his journey, um, at least roundabout. Maybe they'll make find a more direct way to, to do it, but the whole Mace, uh, Mace Raymond thing I don't think is, is going to happen. Yeah, yeah I, 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 some knock I like problems, to think so. that they're going on a trip. Yeah, and I want, and then you kind of need Sam to go away for when, uh, so, so he can't explain with uh, John's actions. Everything. Well, the whole hard home is, is a complete wild card because that could be an excuse to get rid of characters, to send people away, mm. you know, to hard home mm. rather than to old town or to sending Ed away, sending Gren, Gren and Pipper dead, but he's got people around him that he trusts and, but I mean, John's going to Hard Home, isn't he? He's going to be on the trip. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> saying that people might not make it back after Hard Home. That he uh, trusts, okay. you know? You're saying Sam might not make it back, or what? Uh, not Sam so much, but Tormund maybe, and uh, maybe Ed. God forbid. God forbid. Not Ed. So let's head to Volantis, or the road to Volantis, and then Volantis itself to wrap up this episode. We get some more wheelhouse quips between Tyrion and and Varys, and Tyrion just really wants wants out of the wheelhouse, which I completely understand. And we get Volantis and the Long Bridge, which I thought was pretty cool. Not particularly uh, made sense as a bridge because you can't really get across it in a vehicle. But other than that, I was fine. <laughs> also, not that long. But we only saw we didn't see the whole bridge. It could have just been the we last. We didn't see quarter. one end. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's supposed to be like this super long bridge that crosses the groin, you know? <laughs> well, the groin was about a foot th- foot deep. Yeah, <laughs> so. the groin was a trickle. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Pick your battles, Zach. <laughs> I like big sweeping shots, though it did look pretty nice, though it's kind of weird we're going to get like one scene in it, it feels like. In the land? Yeah, yeah I think we're done with it. I think we're done with it. We don't know where Jorah is taking Tyrion. <laughs> he better be oh, taking her to queen. Danny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which Tyrion's got nothing to complain about. He's like, I'm going to take you where you're going anyway, just faster and more directly. So shut up. <laughs> or maybe, he, maybe, he's, maybe he's taking to the queen, the, the, the queen in the brothel. Yeah. Maybe he's taking her to the Queen of Thorns in Highgarden. <laughs> keep keep yeah. it going. Last one out. Can't talk to him. Selyse. Baratheon. <laughs> Alanis Harlow. But yeah, I, I kind of miss the whole dragon, the Blackstone and everything like that. on Blackstone Bridge and the Blackstone Wall and everything. The huge walls like that. that all kinds of chariots can drive across. Yeah, exactly. It's it's it seems qu- quite ordinary. The city. Yeah, right? it definitely felt more like a European village than like a big foreign metropolis. And as we know, whatever. everything in Europe is the same. That's true. <laughs> yes, it, accents and cities. <laughs> everything everything in is, the is the same. Same. So it makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> You say it in jest, Greg, but I think there was some interesting similarities between Bravos and and Volantis that almost made it feel. Obviously, is intended, I think, to make it feel like it came from the same culture, like the same background and roots. Like the architecture had enough in common, the coloring had enough in common. You knew you were in a different city, but there was like you know that you are in Essos. This is part of the same place, ish. But see, but see, Bravos has has been built by slaves and and. All sorts of different cultures coming together to get away from Valyrian people, yeah. the Valyrian people. But but Volantis, 
specifically built from from Valyrian heritage, and and a lot of the stuff there is Valyrian architecture. Yeah, I didn't see any so, towers that were only accessible by dragons there. So yeah, and lava. Ones. Lots of lava everywhere. I agree that they want to simplify it for viewers that make it so that they can connect that this is Essos and this is the same continent. But obviously, for in the books, they're vastly different and pretty much nothing alike. Yeah, and especially if they're only spending an episode or two there, it doesn't. It's just a new city, yeah. and we're moving on. Mm-hmm. Most a lot of the the TV show viewers I talk to, they still can't like wrap their heads around where Danny is in the world. Like, because that last pan in the scene, like it's weird. It goes upside down and then comes down on the other side of the world, and they just accept it. Like, they, I talked to a couple people, like I don't really know. I know she's far away, but like I don't know that continent. It doesn't make sense. To me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're not. I don't think the showrunners are too worried about. Uh, they just they're showing that it's a new city. Yeah, yeah. That's basically us when before we got the lands of ice and fire, right? Essentially. What do you think about the very small slave tattoos on the faces? I thought they would be much more dramatic than that. Loved it. Seems like those were kind of. I didn't. Minuscule. I didn't think that. I I don't remember exactly how they're, they're described in the books, but I didn't have an issue with it. I well, what if your looked... slave changes occupations? You need to space add a add a add, add a another. You cut off part of their face. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I, I Sounds like brutal, something but they do. like in a historical context of slavery that fits quite appropriately. Yeah. Melt off the tattoo. Oh. Well, in in uh, in the world of ice, in the world of ice fire, the tattoos look large as well. I would yeah. say so. Mm-hmm. I don't care. But I'm yeah, just glad they kept that detail because it's very coded into my understanding of the Valentine culture. So I'm glad they they kept that. I thought it was yeah, a cool thing. Definitely. And no tigers. <laughs> or elephants. <laughs> or elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and no temple of uh, Relor. Well, uh, well, the CGI budget was blown, obviously, so they just got uh, an alley of Relor. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, I like that. It was like a street revival or whatever. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I thought that fit. Yeah, it's, it, it's it, sort of like right. an uprising. It felt right. It felt very organic and very like, you know, like obviously it was like plotted, but it, it felt to me like the type of thing that could happen. And like, ooh, where are we going to see, you know, more of these of these priests pop up like Kof Makoro? It's- yeah, it's it, like it's like people gathering in the streets for demonstration type thing. It, it, I thought it was really fitting, actually. It fits the the red priestess in the streets of Atlantis fits a lot again. I guess the theme of this episode is religion, right? Like faith and the public. So in this one, you have the red priest, and instead of having a big fancy temple, she's in the street appealing to the like the masses or being influential in a popular level. So that's that's more subversive and more dangerous to the Valentine structure than just. Like, oh, here's this giant building with lots of authority. Yep. Asian red priest. I guess we have to make note of that since she's like the first one ever in the show. Yep. Apparently the waif was supposed to be Asian, but then. All those blonde haired Asians that we. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I actually like that actress who was playing the waif, but it's too bad that they, you know, didn't cast a person of color. Eh, It only took them five seasons to to cast an Asian, so it's all right. And we're going to have a couple. (laughs) One of the Sand Snakes, I believe, is. uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Half Chinese, I think. I just feel a little mm. uncomfortable being the white guy going, the Asian, the Asian, the Asian. So, uh, <laughs> as you should. With my agents, I'm aware. Fellow Asians. <laughs> and she gives Tyrion that 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 daggers look, which has all kinds of possible meanings. Yeah, I if I was one of the people like caught up in her sermon, like, oh, they're so great, like, well, why'd she stop? What? Who's <laughs> what that? Was she looking oh. at? <laughs> and then it, like for three straight seconds. It wasn't just a quick. Maybe play. she didn't stop. Maybe maybe it was magic. Oh, she was in like, Tyrion's oh. mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see the red eye of Sauron flesh in his brain. <laughs> <laughs> I see you. Yeah. I see you. <laughs> 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 hey, stop with but the. Uh... <laughs> I do wonder about this because I feel like it is kind of a hint that Tyrion. I mean, we can assume this probably, but it's a hint that Tyrion is going to have some kind of kind of rollery shit happening with him later. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe the, the the our Asian red priestess is going to be Mokoro. Oh, okay. So who's going to be Victorian then? <laughs> We're not getting Victorian. Yeah, no Victorian, so no Mokoro. Well, yeah. unless unless as I pointed out on the Wolfcast, maybe Tyrion's going to be Victorian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You could just be Tyrion. I mean, that works too. Vic, Vic, you mean Victorian? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like that. This way, Makoro yes. just has long, a farther way to swim. Because <laughs> all Victorian was doing was bringing him a boat. No, so as long God. as someone gets shit on by a monkey, I'll be happy. Probably Jorah. <laughs> of course. 
Poor Jorah. Speaking of Jorah, he is, he is hanging out in the brothel with uh, Tyrion that they go to. And it seems that uh, Danny's outfit is the, is the Halloween outfit of the year, especially in the brothels. Everybody he wants to know who's doing it. Uh, you mean cosplay Danny? Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's missing part of her costume. Yeah, that's, that's I noticed that. I think that was intentional. That might have been intentional. An artistic uh, it might have been. decision. Yeah. Oh. Cosplay is expensive and time consuming. I can see how she left that part out. That's true. Yeah, just the <laughs> wardrobe well, department's budgets uh, have been cut they, this year. Well, that's really hot I, there in Blanche. You need a little, you know, little, little, little breeze. <laughs> yeah, well, I liked it. So <laughs> <laughs> easy access. <laughs> Okay. I just would like to let the record show this is not the person who plays Danny's body or body. I don't know if it's body doubles the right word. It's just the person who like stands around for lighting and, and scene stuff like that. It's not the same it's person. So, yeah. Stunt double. It's not stunt We're double. Sta- it's stand in. Stand in. Stand in is the word. There, there we, go. we go. But maybe is she the butt double? She might be the butt double. <laughs> <laughs> Are we done with the butt double talk? All right. <laughs> I really liked the um the the prostitute that Tyrion was talking to. I thought yeah. she was really cute and like sassy and I really I liked her. I thought she her. was Penny for a second or at least the show's version. Yeah, yeah. she had that like girlish look. I I, yeah. I kind of I doubt she'll be back, but I kind of was like, I, I you look interesting. I would like to see more of you. I agree with that. It, but we of course have to talk about how this completely changes Tyrion's character <laughs> and that he does he's not going to be doing the whole Oh, he's a super nice guy. You know, he's a nice guy and he's funny. He's still funny. He's nice. He's hasn't even asked where whores go, so it's it's fine. <laughs> not even he told once. that Viking to suck his cock. That was funny. Yeah. <laughs> Ragnar Lothbrok just showed up yeah. in uh, Volantis. He's the bouncer in Volantis. <laughs> That's all of Victorian we're going to see. That right there. Yeah, that was him. <laughs> I mean, it's a, to go a little bit serious. I don't. I mean, I I really don't care for the, the people complaining about the whitewashing because I because I just never I hated Tyrion's characters in the fifth book. So I'm I'm glad they're taking this direction. And also, I mean, this is. Because of the the change in Shay's character, Tyrion, this is this is no longer the same Tyrion. Tyrion's not driven by the same motivation as he is in the book anymore. The, yeah. the Tyrion in the books is driven by self hatred and also um, resentment. This one is more self loathing and just general confusion and sadness rather than pure hatred. Yeah, that's yeah. I, it's it's well said, it's Bing. a depression born of of despair, not of like rage and. I don't think, you know, the, the, the two emotions are close enough that like, and you know what? I'm just going to say it. If we don't, if they, they, they left out a canonical rape, I'm fine. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no one's complaining though. I really wish he raped that prostitute. Jeez. <laughs> Sometimes well. these conversations are really dark, you guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the argument is that it obviously seriously complicates our understanding of Tyrion and we we don't like him as much, which a lot of people, you know, make the counterpoint with Jamie, where we start to like him, we start to not like Tyrion here. But again, I, it doesn't really bother me that much um, personally, but I, I do think that is a thing. It, it doesn't complicate him in that way. Vikings, though. But, yep. <laughs> Also true. Yeah. Hmm. So moving on to Meereen. Uh, oh, wait, there is no Meereen. So we're done. Way to go. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. there was no Dorn. There was no Dorn. No Dorn. Mm-hmm. Um, just the whole thing about the queen. I just assumed he's taking her to Danny. Like, do you guys, are we meant to believe? Of course. Okay. Of course. I didn't think there was any debate yeah. about it. But I was like, why yeah. is he I mean, taking the, her to Cersei? What's well, it? the misdirection is that he's taking her to Cersei because she's the one with the bounty, right? But obviously it's Jorah. He's taking yeah, her to so, Danny. Yeah, so, so they'll cut Tyrion's head off and then Jorah will get his head cut off right after that. <laughs> the misdirection is that Tyrion will actually meet Danny. It's Martin who screwed us in book five. <laughs> <laughs> I think the misdirection is good also in, in that we don't actually, like, if you're just a show viewer, you don't know what Jorah's going to do. Um, assuming you remember that that's Jorah, you're not like, oh, that's, that's you know, he's definitely going to go to Danny when she just exiled him. You know, he could be trying to make his way back to Westeros, you know. So I do mm-hmm. think that there is, is reason to believe that Tyrion would be in danger there, even though obviously we know not. I want all the Tyrion sass, though. So much sir, Tyrion sass. Yeah, he I want to go talk to someone with hair. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think Varys was well, doing when Tyrion got kidnapped? He just yeah, in his I mean, corner, it, twiddling it, his thumbs? It felt very un for him to be so unaware. I definitely get that complaint. It, it's weird for me. Like, I feel like it's it's just strange that they hadn't come this far for him to just, I guess, I don't I mean, they might do something with him, but for him to just lose track of Tyrion and that's the end of it. Yeah, yeah no, but by now he's back in the 
walls at the Red Keep. Come on, that guy moves. Sure, so yeah. He's gonna go kill, kill Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> He's just waiting with that. With the, was, was it a crossbow? Yeah, yeah. Crossbow. Yes. yeah crossbow. I just felt like he would have had other people with him as even if it's just like hired muscle uh, on the way like who's driving the you know he's got to have like six people driving the the covered wagon or something but maybe they're just hired you know people from magister illyria i don't know but i feel yeah. like he needs people with him it's getting accelerated and you know they do mention grayscale a couple times you know at the wall mm-hmm. and here again so we know that's going to be a part of yeah, it it's, it's kind oh, of yeah. Actually, it's, in what way is it going to be a part of it is it going to yeah. be just the stone man like i feel like they could do like a scene that they do with the um you know like when Tyrion was being taken to the Eyrie, you know, when the mountain clans attacked him, like a one episode kind of thing. Like, oh, those are the mountain clans. Those are the stone men. But just, I feel the fact that they mentioned it on the wall, it's going to be bigger than that. They could replace the pale mare with, with grayscale though. Just combine those and, you know, just to emphasize mm-hmm. the devastation of this disease. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that that's probably what they're going to do. Uh, I mean, although they seem to be very functionally different diseases, like gr- grayscale doesn't like die out. It seems like, you know, like the, the pale mare epidemic was going to die out after a certain time. Mm-hmm. Grayscale, uh, I think, dies out over a much longer period of time. Like, it's yeah. a more persisting... After period. it kills everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Grayscale's leprosy, pale mare is just supposed to be, like, dysentery. Yeah. Yep. Or typhus or whatever, yeah. Unless you're unless you're a Targaryen, though, so... Yep. It's fine. And everyone's a Targaryen, so we should never come. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be fine. So do you guys think that Targaryens are completely immune to all diseases, or just... Yeah, except madness. No. Yeah, and fire, obviously. Well, some well, died from spring sickness, so... Lots of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, is the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, but they had Dorne. No. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to go down with the firm hand of the law there. All right, so I think that wraps up Dragoncast. We hope you've enjoyed our conversations. Check out the Wolfcast episode as well, which Patrick uh, will have up sometime in the next several months. Boom! He opened up the road to it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And uh, you can join us next time. Join us on the forums, podcastdeviceandfire.com, Vassals of Kingsgrave. And uh, we have some uh, non-Game of Thrones stuff, which will go on after the Game of Thrones season. So stick around for Twin Peaks and Book Club and all sorts of fun stuff. Thanks. Oh, and you're 200. Oh, yeah, 200 is coming out. It is known. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. 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 Ciao.